Hello all and welcome to the inaugural episode of Press Start Turbo, the fortnightly gaming show. For this episode we'll be doing a year in review with the biggest stories of the year. Later we're going to be joined by the composers for Signalis and talk about their work on the game. And finally we'll be talking about our favourite games of the year. Today I'm joined by Billy, Brendan and Julian. <sighs> My favourite will shock you. It will. Shocking and disgusting. Doctors hate his one simple trick. You, you won't last five minutes. If you browse porn Twitter long enough, you can find some crazy gems in there. I just want to do a quick disclaimer before we get into the meat of the show. Um, this is being recorded currently on 13th of November, and I think it's going to be released sometime in January. Yeah. So if some of the stuff that we talk about is irrelevant by then, that's why. Yeah, we, we, we we're pre-recording this because it's a new show, and we want to make sure that we don't put out garbage like the rest of our stuff. Cameron is a liar. It's actually the 12th, but uh, his point stands. So. Speaking of garbage, <laughs> Spe the fucking year has been dog shit for video game developers. Incredibly good for oh, games, though. Are we jumping into layoffs? What do you mean? What do you mean? I play video game in current year and it's freaking ass awesome and epic. What, what do you mean things are bad? Yeah, dude, what do you mean things are bad for video games? Because freaking Atomic Heart came out and like, dude, I've been slopping up and down on that all year. Dude, that's so true. Was this the year that we got fucking... Did we did we get high on life this year or was that last year? I think that was last year. That was, Kaylin, I was last year for sure. Uh, I can't even talk about Callisto Protocol. Oh, God. I can't can't fucking keep track anymore. No, we're talking about layoffs, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. In, in the news today, just heard the two-headed man got fired. So oh. in the estimated total of layoffs in 2023 for video games is currently at 6,500. It's probably going to increase by the time this episode comes out. Um, it's uh. It's been big studios, small studios, uh, successful studios, uh, <laughs> fucking live service games, uh, stuff that's yep. not come out. I think the, like, for me, the one that, like, is the... <sighs> It feels the worst is Bungie. when it happens after a studio gets ac acquired by a larger ah. company. Yeah. Um. So like, yeah, Bungie Mediatonic got hit incredibly hard, oh, like almost really? the entire. Yeah. So they got yeah. per they got purchased by Epic, and then this year when Epic did their layoffs, uh, Mediatonic was one of the biggest studios hit. Um. And Jesus. then like there are stories from the developers where they're not even making games anymore. They've they've been divested to other other studios and projects where they're just making yep. like Fortnite skins or uh, oh, what I didn't know any that. shit like that. I yeah, well, yeah. Was, yeah. I thought they were still doing Fall Guys. I mean, I'm sure they. I'm sure there there's a part of them that's still doing uh, Fall Guys updates, DLC, collab skins, whatever. But I didn't yeah. know they were also it's, in the Fortnite mines. It's really shocking how fucking. Uh, unequivocally mismanagement can be pointed to as the primary reason for these things so often like uh the uh the need for speed example jumps to mind and i think it started like a decade ago um i forget exactly when but um a new studio was formed by ea for the explicit purpose of developing need for speed called ghost games um they had a lot of flops, but there were a few bangers in there. They had a bit of a cult fan base, and they were doing okay for themselves. Uh, but the kicker is that whenever they put out Need for Speed Heat, um, the second latest one, it was considered by a lot of people to be them like finding their stride, figuring out what about their Need for Speed works. And pretty much as soon as they put that out, the studio was liquidated. And That's part so of the fucking awesome. Well, oh, no, sorry, not liquidated. Uh, massively downsized to become okay. a technical support studio. Um, uh, oh, no. So they would only do reasons. bug testing and shit? 
Well, like QA and like oh, uh, technical support for engine stuff, I think. Um, it's just they I don't have... have a project of their own. Like they don't have something. Right. Basically, they killed the creativity of the studio and they just told right. them it's well, time well, to get. Well, here's oh. the thing. Here's, here's what I found so interesting about it is that during the statement that EA put out, um, one of the things that they outlined as being the reason that this studio uh, had to be downsized to stop having, uh, you know, games made with it is that, um, you know, shit, do you mind if I look this up real quick because this is a news segment, so I want to be correct? Go for it. Um, I, I feel like a lot of us are in here are like very art focused, like cre- we're, we're all creative. So like the moment I, I feel like the moment any of us hears anything about like the man killing art, it's just. Ugh. OK, got it. So uh, Ghost Games was set up in Sweden, um, which is not exactly what you'd call a hub of video game development or tech dev in general. EA cited as one of the main reasons that they were shutting it down as it being really difficult to set up a AAA size development studio in Sweden because they'd have to ask a bunch of people to either move to Sweden or try really hard to onboard people in Sweden and it wasn't working out for the scale of a Need for Speed game which drove me fucking insane because A, why the fuck did you try to set up a AAA studio in Sweden and B, why the fuck is the only alternative to making a AAA studio in Sweden to turn them into a support studio? But whatever, I guess. I feel like I have an answer. Does Sweden have like tax breaks? Because that's usually oh, what happens. Oh, definitely. Because oh, in, definitely. In, Mon- the, in Montreal, the reason why a lot of studios are over here in Montreal where I live is because of tax breaks. And like we, they, mm. uh, a, a lot of the, the government will like push t- like incentives to get people in here yeah austin texas does that too yeah austin does that as well did you know we have no business tax in a lot of ways i i i i wonder how much regarding like the total like gaming layoffs thing is just related to um companies not hitting covid targets and just constantly trying to raise the uh, we need to make profit at all costs so we need to cut as many people as we can when we can because i feel like not not just for like the video games industry, but I feel like this whole year I've been seeing layoffs from Best Buy, layoffs from Walmart, layoffs from mm-hmm. different like mm-hmm. um, just different companies altogether. And uh, it, it, like genuinely, I think this is not quite just an industry wide problem, but just an everything problem, an economy problem. We we are going into the recession, baby. Uh, we're going into we are, baby. <laughs> My analysis is that it's the result of chasing endless growth without any kind of management thinking about what if that what, what's is impossible. The like, what's and the was, like, I didn't realize we were going to be this explicit with well, because uh, if Let's you look it. at like um, look at any of the profit quarterly for any of these companies um, during 2020 when everybody was at home, everybody was buying video mm. games, everybody was picking up hobbies. And there was kind of going into 2021, there was kind of indiscriminate growth, not only in the video game industry, of course, but of course, we'll stick to that. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody was trying to find some way to entertain themselves. And so uh, a big part of that is uh, everybody is hired, everybody's acquired as much as they can. And now people are still buying video games. Video games are still coming out uh, uh, good, albeit sometimes a little buggy and broken. Um, but you're, uh, you have companies, <laughs> of course, of the decade. yeah, you have, you have, you have video games coming out, uh, but they're also within that vicious cycle of, we need to be making money constantly and always hitting higher and higher profit targets. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Do, we do? Ah, let us fire people. Exactly. And the, the thing is that it always, the buck always falls on the developers and not the management as well as you'll notice that like. You know, the Bungie case in specific, like, they had the massive acquisition by Sony. Uh, I can't remember the actual amount, but it's like they were given a certain amount of money that they just have in a fucking bank account sitting there. And instead of, like, looking at that or looking at the CEO's, like, salary, when Sony comes and says, you have to cut costs, the first thing they do is, well, we can get rid of a bunch of people's jobs. Well, see, here's the thing, and this is going to really piss you off, but I need to make a disclaimer. I don't know for sure whether or not this is um, this is alleged, um, but the last I heard about what is, at time, at time of recording, a developing story, um, so take it with a grain of salt. Bungie specifically 
Um, at one point, you know, they were going to try to uh, they were going to try to set up like a class action lawsuit on behalf of the, comp the uh, employees who were fired for wrongful termination because uh, Bungie assured them that the PlayStation acquisition would not change their, um, you know, the, like they would still be employed or some some variant of like, you know, you know assuring them that you know they'd have their job and then that wasn't the case but after it came out that bungie was not pressured by playstation to make this decision in any direct capacity from what uh, journalists have been able to find it's just a decision they made independently um, yes it, it, see but, but uh, in a vacuum that's true but the troublesome thing and what pisses me off so much is that another of the latest developments is that um again allegedly um, Bungie got a fuckload of shares, uh, as part of the PlayStation acquisition deal, and a lot of that was supposed to go to employees after a certain period of time, which happened to coincidentally coincide with the time that a lot of them were fired so mm -hmm. that the shares defaulted to Bungie's uh, ownership instead of the, the employees, yep. which is really cool because it also happened to be almost around the exact same time that those employees were let go um, around the time that their uh, health care would have been renewed. Yep, it was the last day of the month. So then their health care oh, doesn't awesome. renew. They, 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 they got fired. They had one day of health care. And then after that, uh, you know, lol. Could you imagine moving cities to go work for the studio and then also working there for five plus years? Like some of yeah. these people who are working there were like tenured staff. F and, and fucking Michael Salvatore and his entire team of composers were let go. Like, like the guy, the guy, no, Cameron, the guy who designed the original Halo logo was let go as part of these layoffs. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Core staff. And I feel like the mentality of developers is so poisoned as well by by all this stuff happening because I remember reading a developer uh, on Twitter after they got laid off from Bungie going, it's like devastating and all this, but they're just thinking like, what did I do wrong? As if it's somehow uh. something to do with their like work or their ethic. Because like the, you have the CEO coming out the days after in an internal memo that got leaked saying, we kept the right people. Which is yeah. probably it, one of the most disgusting things I've like read from a CEO after a layoff. The double talk is insane, you know, because I mean, I, I mean, not that not that it should surprise anyone, but the public, uh, the public statement he did was that like we lost so many good people, we're so sorry to do this, but we had to in order to fucking whatever. And one day later, in sort of internal memo, he goes like, "Yeah, we we kept who we needed to keep." That's fucking awesome. What a that's so cool. I uh, yeah, yay! Can't say that, dummy. All right, sorry. Say sorry. something worse. <laughs> <laughs> what a. F what? What? Jesus. what? No! <laughs> Not even your word, first off. This fucker tanking Apolog the show. In apologize the first to episode. black people right now. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 that's Don't do that. Don't do that to me, man. Oh, man. That's not going in. That's not going in. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Pretty said, funny if it went in. <laughs> Wink said camera. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things I do want to talk about real quick when we talk about layoffs is, uh, I mean, one of, one of the things that I don't, I'm not sure if it's, um, I'm not sure if it's been uh, said like outright, but a lot of the games that have been really successful lately have been single player games, smaller experiences. And a mm. lot of the industry for, a, for, a, for a decent amount of time, they, there was a big shift towards live service, which is. Life service is gigantic. Like a project like that, they they're like the dev teams have to be huge. Uh, they have to be kept up nonstop and like keep up with the content, all that. And because of the because of the failures of like, fuck man, how, what what did we have? We had Avengers that failed miserably. Uh, we had the. Remember Rock when Suicide Steady. Squad was announced and then um and then immediately pushed oh, back Christ. Uh, because they were chasing like loot. Gotham Enemy. Knights. Uh, Gotham, Gotham Knights, Knights was also supposedly supposed to be live service, then they pivoted immediately during like tail end of production. <laughs> but it still has like the gear score. Basically, like all these yeah. gigantic fucking live service games that are getting shifted from live service into like oh even PlayStation 15, they, they, they announced they had like 15 live service games that all had mm -hmm. to like either pivot into single player or downsize, right? Mm -hmm. That was like, uh, notoriously what 
what caused uh, some of the I think it was there was layoffs at Naughty Dog. Yeah, exactly. Because Bungie like played Last of Us Factions and was like, "This is shit. This is so uh, bad." Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Oh, and so man. they they're, they're like, "Well, we're fucking dropping drop. We're like practically like getting dropping all of our developers service. out of this project." And fucking gonna lay off some stuff to yeah. save some money on the way out. So, I mean, live service games in general and the industry attach themselves to it so, so, so hard because you look at a game like Destiny, you know, a couple of years ago and it has um, a smaller base than some video games, but it has such a fervent, rabid fan dedicated. base that is consistently dedicated. injecting money into the game. They have like an incredibly dedicated fan base. So I think the, the the chasing of live service to the end of chasing of live service now is also just related to the layoffs because it's just that vicious cycle of with a live service yep. game, you can continuously squeeze money out of your customers through just one experience versus having to make multiple different experiences. But what happens when those live service games don't work out? Yes. Layoffs happen. It's kind so of just how it is. That, that leads into exactly what I wanted to talk about, actually. They chase oh, the effervescent, yeah. dude, let's do gear, and then the gear is boring. This is a big point and parcel for me, like, on the, like, game dev side of it, is if you're going to make a game with, like, loot and gear to entice your players to spend money, why have it be boring? Like, I have played Outriders, right? I've played, oh, God, Oh, my Jesus. God, Jesus Christ. I, I played Redfall this year, Fallout 76, and Fallout 76 has gotten better. But because they, Fallout 76 has gotten better because they pivoted away from live service kind of rust-like into, hey, the, he, we're putting work into the single player content and the content that'll make you want to come back into it versus like, dude, a new event, uh, fight five alien porbos and get yourself the shit gun. Um, no fucking but way. A, but a big thing for me is um like, uh, look at a game like Destiny with Cool Gun, look at a game like even Borderlands with Cool Gun. And uh, you look at Redfall or Outriders where it's like, oh, uh, get 5% more weapon damage towards elemental oh effects. Can we, it, can we just, I, sorry, real quick. I'm so tired. If you're going to fucking, with no, when it comes to like upgrades in video games, can we stop with the 5 to, five to 15 No, yeah, absolutely. Upgrades? Holy shit. 20% or up. Kind of like two literally has an armor system that's like three percent less critical health damage. Oh my uh, for this god! Reason. I'm gonna vomit. Uh, and gear. my lawyers have advised me not to comment on this. My <laughs> big, my, my my biggest uh, like part of that is that like like even when it makes its way into single player games like that. Like I remember, I love the game Control, but oh, the control fucking weapon, the weapon so mods are just completely, stuff. completely just like redundant. And well, because it's 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 also could if you look at control, um, one of my favorite video game of all time. If you look at control and you look at how live services even affected single player games like that, like mm, the, the yeah. control didn't need any of that stuff, and and control is littered with uh oh hey we have radiant quests and radiant missions. Go fight five pumbos in the pumbo sphere that you were there yes. for a quest God, earlier. I hated yeah. that shit so it's, much. And it just it, it like like sours your experience with what is otherwise like a really good fucking game. Like yeah. I, I've um, I've actually known people who have dead ass stopped control because they saw the upgrades and they thought because the thing with control is that it's such a finely tuned game and it, the encounters are really hard. They they know it's going to be hard, but the thing is, some people I've I, I've met have played the game. They saw the upgrades and how tiny the upgrades are, and they thought that they would have to grind. To keep like up with the game, mm. even though the difficulty is like perfectly tuned. Oh, dude, I don't know. It's just, it sucks. To to bring it back around to live service, I f I find it really interesting that so many of the of the new projects that were gunning for that are now you know walking it back, reeling it in, or otherwise doing their best to pivot, both pre and post launch. Um, because on the one hand. Uh, so, so I think I think the fundamental issue and the reason that so many of these are failing is because the the bar for what makes a gratifying live service game has become so high with the likes of Fortnite that it is completely uh, unrealistic for basically anyone who isn't a giga fuck mega company uh, to even try to compete. Oh yeah, it's unreachable. Um, uh, and yet. A million people try it anyway, right? And so now that now that everyone is seeing it fail, unless you're Epic Games, it, it's becoming inevitable to have to pivot because it's like, oh fuck, we we actually just can't compete with that, which is good, right? I mean, it's like it's good that like we're not having these insane uh, these insane aspirations anymore. But uh, the amount of damage that was done to an 
an innumerable amount of projects at every stage of development makes me wonder whether or not there could have been a fucking easier way to learn this stupid lesson. And by extension, whether it's good that Fortnite now basically has a stranglehold alongside Call of Duty and fucking Apex, I guess, on the market of live service. And My lawyers have, av shit. have advised me not to comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, I think it's it comes from like the fact that it was... The, the highs are so high when you succeed at a live service. Like, the amount of fucking money you can make off, like, like constantly. It's just the, the problem is that the risk is also, like, insane. Like, there's, yeah. there's, there's a limited amount of uh, public interest. And 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 it has to be a sustained interest, and, right? And, and and not not even just interest, camera. Not even. I, I think a lot of it that people don't think about is just like you only have so much fucking time in the day. Yeah. And if Fortnite and Destiny and Halo and everything else, if they all want you to be playing for fucking twelve hours a day, ideally, yeah. That it's just like at a certain point. People are just going to pick one and stick with it, or they're just going to clock out altogether. You can't complete every fucking battle pass. It's literally impossible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you look at trends in gaming, a lot of trends in gaming sometimes devolve into treat the video game like your job. Uh, look at WoW yeah. back in the day. Look at MMOs back in the day. Every MMO. Fucking Eve. Uh, the, the big thing about <laughs> MMOs, and, and if you look at like the MMO um, timeline after WoW was successful, like the big boom of WoW, every other MMO tried to copy WoW, and then guess what? At the end of the day, when those people came to the new MMO, like Terra, like Wildstar, Fucking all of these older video Terra. games, all of these older MMOs, the second they d were done with the content that was there, they went right back to WoW. Similar with live service games, as you, if, if you have a looter shooter, um, a la Destiny, if you have like Outriders or other video games like Division 2, at the end of the day, people are going to go right back to the base, the foundation. They're going to go right back to Destiny mm -hmm. when they're done with your content. And they're not going to care about your game. You're going to have an incredibly small number of people wanting to play that game, but the, the big thing is you have this, um, video game developers are always looking at the massive school of fish uh, and the school of fish is always staying in their humble little home and the school of fish will sometimes pop out and explore. Um, but unless your experience is so unique and different, uh, they're only going to visit. They're not going to stay and they want people to yeah. stay, but without knowing what yeah. makes them wanting to stay. And that's the thing. If you're like made like a small single player game, if they're coming to visit, you've fucking made your money, you've spent your money and all you care about is the for initial purchase. Whereas like you like uh, they come to play division two, but then they never come back for any of the updates or DLC. You're fucked. Like you've, you're now spent all this money after development and no one's even going to play it and you're not making any money off it. It's completely I like ju I just, ridiculous. I, I, I hate where we are so bad. Remember whenever we were all complaining about like this fucking cosmetic item, you can only buy it. And it's like fucking it's OK uh, if it, it's OK to buy something, but we need to be able to earn it through gameplay. And the monkey's paw in the room heard that and shit. That shit was like, oh, my God, let me fucking cook, bro. Oh, I'm about to make this so much worth baby. pay to be able to earn it. Yeah. <laughs> or hey, you can you can earn it. You can earn it. It'll just take you five days real time. Don't worry about it, bro. You got what you wanted. If you play Assassin's Creed Odyssey and you do the weekly quests every single week, you'll be able to earn enough coins after three months to unlock one pierce uh, one piece of microtransactional gear. Oh boy, we we opened the Bren Daniel box of uh uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey only one to a hundred percent, right? No, that was no, Valhalla. no Valhalla, Valhalla, yeah. Valhalla is you worse because they you they one hundred percent of Valhalla, bro. I, I did one hundred percent it. I beat most of the. So oh. when I played Valhalla, I beat most of the side content. I beat oh most of the side missions and the main story. It took me a hundred hours. Uh, video games. Hey, sometimes video games don't need to be that long, Buster. Which is the thing that, like, even single player games were chasing because the the video games is a job the, in the industry. They were chasing the hey, we want players to come back week after week after week. So uh, here, here's a hundred hour mega fuck game with um yeah rock stacking. All right, so like other big news stories. I want to say you guys want to talk about the Nintendo closing the eShop. Oh, Christ. Uh, for I mean, that's where we're going with any digital shop. I mean, at some point, that's a digital shop be. is going to die. It's inevitable, and you're not going to be able to lock down all those games, which is why I fucking love physical media. Are Nintendo still, like, anti-emulator and anti- Of course. Oh, yeah. Of course. Which is, but, like, how can you have that stance, but also be like, well, we're just going to shut down our digital storefronts for all these uh, platforms, so now there's oh, no legal way to Cameron. actually get most because of Because they silly don't Cameron. care. You expect a Nintendo to be consistent and care. <laughs> I actually don't. I mean, I, I don't see the reason 
if I'm honest, for not re-releasing, I guess, pro I mean, I guess it would be like creating an emulator or whatever, and then basically... Well, with re-releasing certain things, you're gonna you're looking at like a, a, a putting a full dedicated team on, on making an emulator properly work on Nintendo newer Nintendo hardware, and then oh, also... Oh, man, I'm, Nintendo could never afford that. They, 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 well, they could, but like, they don't want to. <laughs> I'm not like, no, I'm not like playing I'm devil's advocate joking. for the big fuck company or anything. Oh, but no, the, the biggest thing is, is the worst. Obviously... Yeah, that's my job. They've looked at the numbers, and they just have decided the numbers aren't worth it. We save more money mm. by shutting down this and then re-releasing re yep. them separately yep. as a paid thing whenever we feel like and, it. Uh, that, and the thing about Nintendo that I find so in endlessly frustrating as well is that unlike Sony and Microsoft, Nintendo doesn't have to care as much about the public perception of their brand uh, because they, they know that Mario. so many people uh, are either A, just going to buy it anyway because of just endless brand loyalty towards the IPs, or B, they're children and they don't know any better. And so they just aren't held to the same standard of Microsoft and Sony where they have to like actually try to keep their player base happy all the time and treat them well. This was like the year for me where I decided I'm never buying anything Nintendo ever again. I can't remember mm. what happened, but I got really upset at Nintendo this year and I was like, you know what? I, it was, I can't was it whenever they anymore. sued some guy for making a Mario Kart mod? I, I feel, and ruined I his think fucking he was, life. I think he was cheating on Mario Kart and they decided to literally <laughs> ruin his life. Who the fuck cheats on Mario Kart? That's so funny. It's a really funny thing to do. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's actually a big thing right now about Mario Kart item smuggling or whatever. <laughs> what? Oh no, dead ass. There's like, dude, I don't know. There's like a thing where people play, dude. I this is like, <laughs> this is so beyond me. I feel like we're going into topics that we have no idea about. Yeah, I just I've never I just heard saw of this. We should we should probably I just saw stop. A bunch of, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. You know what? Th we're going in. We're going in. This is about something oh, we have no idea moment. about. Yeah, podcast yeah, yeah. moment. This is about something we have no idea about. Brace your fucking little pussy. So basically, what happened <laughs> is. There's people cheating. <laughs> There's people that are cheating like in Mario Kart and they're doing a thing called item smuggling or something. I saw this on Twitter and people are pissed about it. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but apparently the uh, playing online in Mario Kart, people have found a way to cheat like without mods or anything and just like use the game itself to cheat because of with like they use like item boxes and respawns. Like you know when you throw yourself off of a off of a cliff like the Lucky 2 just fucking grabs you and puts you somewhere people have found a way to use like both of those to basically cheat and do a lap or whatever <laughs> oh yeah item that smuggling and, yeah. item smuggling yeah. is the process of taking a low place item back when you're like in a lower ranking and then taking it to a high place i.e like having a bullet bill from being in eighth place getting all the way to like second place and then utilizing it before the end of the match yeah yeah that's the one and is that people is that cheating <laughs> I mean, I mean that's using like the you. game systems. I mean that's within the game's parameters. That's 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 cheesing, not cheating. Yeah. That's cheesing. But people are pissed, dude. Mario Kart. <laughs> I didn't know that Mario Kart had such a dedicated fucking online. Like I, oh, I thought. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no, I, I, I'm not surprised. To me, to me, Mario Kart is so randomized that it, it it's so randomized it cannot it can't be anything but casual. But apparently absolutely not apparently That's it's like so, it's really funny to imagine people playing mario kart and being like you're not playing fair yeah dude oh you mean you mean literally the last 30 years of gaming julian you're not playing fair when it comes to mario kart <laughs> like <laughs> yeah i'm just <laughs> Julian, have you ever uh, have you ever played mario kart with a sibling <laughs> uh, i can't say i have oh dude Mario Kart Wii oh. stinks. I hate Mario Kart Wii. Whenever I used to play with my sisters, they would always make me use the fucking Wii remote with the fucking oh. steering wheel. Never mind. I have. I have. Mario Kart I N64. I thought you meant like a, like a Logitech racing wheel. I was like, I can't say I've tried <laughs> oh, that. Oh, uh, actually, when we used to play Double Dash, we, they would make... We had, we had like two controllers and one steering wheel, and they were like, this steering wheel sucks. You use it. And then I would have to steering wheel the fucking game. Oh, you see. I was the older Real. sibling, so I was the here's yeah. the Mad Cats controller. Let's play Tony Hawk. Uh, we didn't. And it wouldn't Mad be plugged in. Do you know something that's just as competitive as Mario Kart? 
it's the Overwatch League. Uh, oh, great uh, segue! Uh, it's wah. dead. It's dead. It's great. Finally, it's been it's been fucking death spasming for since its inception. I feel did you, like uh, these. Did you guys? Wait, sorry, real quick. Did you guys see the fucking? There was a some fucking coach for the Overwatch League that did a really like deep post about like these were the best years of my life. I'm so happy I did this. And then he posts <laughs> his Twitter post had AI art, and it was just like oh. so, it was just like oh. a few people like bumping fists. And at the yeah. <laughs> at the bottom right of the image, there was just a pile of dildos. Oh, the pile of yeah, dildos. I saw that. Yeah. I saw that. What? It was <laughs> it's so a good. pile of fucking dildos, and everybody in the comments, everybody were like like ah oh, dude i'm so like thank you so much for your work all that and then there was just one guy who was like is that a pile of dildos and then they, <laughs> <laughs> that became a giant fucking thing where everybody would retweet it and be like no way pile of dildos the guy never deleted that tweet either he fucking See, uh, he okay, owned it okay. he owned yeah. it baby if, if, no, uh, theory how funny would it be if he did it on purpose <laughs> <laughs> He like, fucking, like while he was writing his little fucking prompt, he was like, er, and also a bag of dicks. Uh, bag difficult of dick. to spot a um, pile of dildos in l bottom left corner. <laughs> Is but, that how? I don't know how prompts work, dude. Is that how I don't it either. Works? I don't because I don't fucking <laughs> use silly. AI. Computer Overwatch League post fist bump Overwatch style Blizzard style Disney style small small pile of dildos in bottom left corner <laughs> slightly obscured. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i really it's hope so that funny. the way you interface with them is the same way that people interfit the same way that fucking like cyber chase kids talk to the oh fucking my motherboard God. Yeah, computer yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think of it i always think like ai dudes like captain jean-luc picard from tng where he's like uh computer t earl gray hot so it's just uh computer anime breasts boobs huge ones basongas <laughs> Basanga. massive titties <laughs> <laughs> but, Massive uh, titties, huge titties, gigantic anime style, titties, 1990s breasts. <laughs> Generate. Anime um. Style. So regarding regarding the Overwatch League. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, uh, Widowmaker, right? Uh, so regarding uh, the Overwatch League, I remember back working at Best Buy, and uh, I was like, "This is 2018," and Overwatch League. I remember friends, like coworkers, talking about it because. Uh, one of my coworkers was talking about like a training camp experience they went to for uh, their uh, team what? for the Overwatch oh League, God. and it was like in this oh, it's, it's weird. They went to like they traveled from Iowa to the East Coast and they went to this weird seedy motel and they just played Overwatch with other people for like twenty hours a day for a week. And they were like, it was the coolest thing ever in like a Motel Eight. And that was the moment I knew, man, the Overwatch League's gonna be falling apart someday, huh? Yeah, that's they what it. What, what, when I say it's been death spasming since its inception, I, I what I mean, Julian, is have you ever tried to watch a game of Overwatch League being played? I don't watch esports, sorry. Well, regardless, if you have, you would have noticed how fucking illegible anything going on is. It's probably the worst game I've ever seen oh. played at a competitive level because it's, you just can't tell what the fuck's going on. Overwatch is not built for... Uh, competitive at all. There's also like I, I remember like watching it really briefly, and it's fucking impossible because of the hero switch. And I rem this is more for mm -hmm. me maybe, but I remember it being unreadable because people would switch heroes constantly, and yep. it was like, I could not fucking. And then they got rid of that from the so game, complicated. which which deleted like a fun po like Overwatch at its core is a TF2 style. Oh, you can't switch anymore. Yeah. You can't switch anymore. They they got rid of it for that specific reason. I, I think no, you can switch, but it's only specific specific it's, roles. It's I roles, think. so it's like a, yeah. it's like DPS, tank, and heal. Oh. Cameron, that's so fascinating because it sounds like the exact same pitfall that three four three ran into with Halo Five, where it's yep. like they desperately desperately wanted to uh get esports to be a core part of the multiplayer ecosystem to the detriment of the massive player base as a whole who doesn't fucking care and just wants to have fun with multiplayer well, and the and the 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 result was that halo 5 i okay a podcast moment i haven't played the fucking multiplayer but everyone who i've spoken to about it unanimously says yeah it was really fun but it i ain't. have 
Okay, well, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but the the consensus I've heard is that it was just like, yeah, it's pretty fun, but it, it, it sure ain't Halo, and it sure feels like it really wants to be eSport. My favorite part of Halo 5 was playing it and being like, oh my god, there's a pizza skin, and then I got the pizza skin, and then I uninstalled it. Real. It's 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 the, the act of trying to artificially generate an eSports theme for your game right. where when that has been successful, it has been a natural we progression. Should probably, exactly. We should mention how how overwatch teams worked because oh, yeah, I the think franchising I, Guys, the franchising I got a shit, like right now go shit girl we'll, we'll talk about okay. overwatch while you're gone yeah okay. <laughs> bye guys <laughs> that make, play, make me start reverbing more and more as i walk away because i need to go shit I'm are you bringing even when he's shitting he's interrupting uh what i i you yeah, know we gotta talk about the we got to talk about how the franchising works because I think that's yeah. like one of the key fucking reasons as to why the Overwatch oh, yeah. League fucking Were they trying to do like city-based teams? Yes. Or like, yeah. So it okay. was Bobby Kotex. This is like insider oh, like story. It was Bobby Kotex like fucking pet project where he wanted to like basically enrich all of his fucking friends that he knew who were in um is like were real? big ceos and owners of like actual like sports teams wait is and this, he basically is this real like is this a confirmed yes, thing or this is like a um this is like a i don't think anyone's like i don't think he's come out and said it but it's like apparently it was like his vanity project where he like knew a bunch of like uh, uh people and was like hey bro just give me 20 million i'll put you in the overwatch league you're gonna make a shit ton of money off of ad of sponsorships and the, advertising the thing is right like this is all alleged but also of all the people in the world who would do something that fucking stupid and shitty of course it would be kotick what a piece of oh shit. yeah <laughs> what a oh, fucking yeah. worm dude oh my but, god but yeah the, uh, i mean it's an incredible scam like and it's fucking it's ridiculous it's fucked up when that he got tick in his name because he'd be sucking the blood out of companies like that yeah <laughs> but either way to go back to how franchising works um so basically you have slots in your um com in your competitive scene right and you you each slot has a price so basically you have to pay um blizzard 20 million for a buy-in to get a slot in the esports so it's not it doesn't matter how good you are at the game or how good your team is you will always go to overwatch world cup overwatch league you'll always be a part of it whereas in like more traditional thing like sports like uh or, or esports you will have like teams that can only compete because they've won a certain amount of minors or majors or something like that whereas within franchising you're gonna say see the same names and the same teams again because they bought a sport a, a, their way into the sport and then they can always play um so it, it, it's actually probably the worst thing you can do for an esports um, because you're just making it so you don't have to try. <laughs> like oh, there's boy. no like incentive to to play well or do well because it doesn't. There's no like skin in the game really, and also it just means that oh, it's just like a fucking little thing for rich people to to say they have and to try and like make sponsorship money off. Oh, are you loving your $15,000 bottle of wine? Yes. Would you like to talk about my Overwatch League team? They're called the Corn Boys from Iowa. Let's talk about the Tormjord meta. Oh, ready to work. Come get your armor. <laughs> but it's like... <laughs> It's it's probably one of the Shut most up. mismanaged things of all fucking time. Like the twenty million uh, buy-in originally, then for the second season they upped that, even though fucking viewership was already starting to tank by the second season. They're like, all right, now it's thirty-five to sixty million dollars. Apparently, they didn't like announce it, but this was like the reporting was that it was like within that range. I can't believe Heroes of the Storm died for that. I can't even fathom how much money they put into this shit too. Yeah. Like I remember oh, well, they, they were completely it wasn't shifted only the development of the like, game. Yeah, yeah, cuz it wasn't only the they they weren't only doing that. They were also doing the um all the shit with uh like they, they I remember they were like paying schools to get programs specifically for Overwatch esports and shit. Mm -hmm. And it's like you don't even have an like you. It, it's so weird to see a company brute forcing an esports yeah. out of their own. Thing. It's so weird, it, man. It's just that's not how that works. Just to add to what Billy was saying, it's fucked up that 
this is a thing we've seen multiple times now where a company will just try to brute force their way into a successful esports ecosystem. And, it, and so far, I have yet to see it succeed in any way that doesn't involve it organically happening first. Yeah, that's what I'm, I was going to say. I feel like the only way to get any esport like happen is organically. Yeah, crazy. Your do, game like, has to be fun before it's competitive. When it comes, like, because uh, I know more about fighting games and like the scenes, the the scenes for fighting games, like most fighting games, like have been going on for years, and the competitive scenes just natural, like organically happened. Mm -hmm. And they can, an, an or, like a, a competitive scene will survive or like on its own because of the people playing it just like, look at brawl uh they, like right now i i was i was looking at yeah i mean literally smash smash is like fucking that that's another episode we have to do in, on because of the nintendo shit i mean i was mainly just joking about you know I was just joking about the community of Smash Bros. Brawl, but you are, are correct. No, the Sma Smash Bros. community is just fucking... It's uphill, but, but uh, it's worse than uphill, actually. It's, like, uphill, but they're, like, Nintendo are, like, shooting bricks at the fucking tournament organizers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like in the sense of, like, them, them fucking brute-forcing it, like, they completely shifted the direction of the game's development to try and cater towards the competitive scene. Like, that was part of... that's that, Like, you know, after they see their fucking viewers start to drop, they're like, oh, how do we make this a better game to watch? It's like, well, we got to make it, you know, to do cater the development towards pro, pro play. And the average person who's playing Overwatch is not going to like that because they're it's just to make the game less fun and give you less options to make the, the game more easily, like uh picked up by pro players yeah. okay I, I feel like i feel like perhaps the first time i really got a sense of that being like their top priority was whenever they stopped letting you just play as like multiple of the same hero mm -hmm. remember whenever you could just 6v6 no five winstons yeah whenever you could just 6v6 uh. six six winston versus winston on both teams that was oh, the most it, fucking it, fun i've had in that, that was game. It. but yeah. like 6v6 six six winston what was it wasn't that literally the meta it's like comp. <laughs> oh, I, I, I feel like that was. A, I feel like you're right. There was a moment where people were like, "The competitive scene freaking stinks because all you see is like all you see is people rushing as Winston, the, like and turn it off the for same thing. Then turn it off for competitive like five only. Reinhardt Let me have fun. It, you see, that's the weird thing too, because even Dota and League have like casual modes. And then the competitive mode, and then Overwatch was like, no, they're all competitive. I mean, eventually mm -hmm. they did bring in modes that allow you to play. I just want to make sure that I note that, that they did bring in modes that allowed you to do like 6v6 yeah. Winston or 5v5 Winston. Yeah, but you have to like custom queue for that. They don't want it to be a thing you can just do it's casually casual. unless you yeah. really want it. Because casual is just competitive rule set, but it doesn't count in your number uh, score. Anyway, just to cap this discussion off, Activision Blizzard, right after getting acquired by Microsoft, is now having to pay $6 million per team uh, <laughs> to, to those leaving. Uh, so this is two-thirds of the franchise. I'm not entirely sure exactly how many. Of how the teams. many Overwatch League teams are there? There are 19. If it's two-thirds of 19... Two thirds is sixty six percent. So sixty six percent of nineteen is twelve. So that means twelve. Oh my God! Times He's cooking so hard right now. He's boiling water. Seventy two million. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm I'm I, I'm bit I'm bidding. It's active Blizz. They can I'm, afford it. It's it, no. It's Microsoft now. It's Microsoft. <laughs> They could afford it. They can that, afford it. That's but. really fucking incredible, honestly. Um, do you think that's why they were like, oh, we need to, uh, the new World of Warcraft expansions will come out every year or whatever? <laughs> 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 they got to make yeah. their money back. Anyway, a, a fitting end to a terrible idea that just went for way too long. But enough about... Uh, the year in review but enough Let's about talk about music with the signalis fellas <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! 
Hello everyone, welcome to the first interview for Press Start Turbo. Today we're going to be joined by Cicada Sirens, uh, known for their work on Signalis uh, co-composing and also their first al full-length album, Flicker Vertigo. We're also joined by Thousand Eyes. Awesome, man. Good to have you. It's great to be here. One of the cool things uh, about meeting you for the first time was uh, that we started immediately talking about condiments for like a stupidly long <laughs> amount of time. And that's immediately when I knew you were good people because we just kept talking about fucking hot mustard. And I was yeah. like, yeah, that's that's good. That's good people. That's good people right there. <laughs> it was a conversation that started liquor and then moved over to, to hot mustard. <laughs> it was are, actually, it was, uh, oh, let's talk about whiskey. And then uh, we, we went from whiskey to fucking hot mustard. So that's how... Y See, that's how you make friends, <laughs> fellas. Talk about fucking hot mustard. The, the pivot point there is my, my favorite glass to drink liquor out of. It's an old mustard glass that this hot mustard came in. And uh, I've just been drinking liquor out of it for years. It's uh, <laughs> probably not something to, to admit on a podcast. But Oh, my God. We admit it's so much worse. <laughs> We've admitted crimes. <laughs> this, you have no idea. <laughs> Getting the rough stuff out of the way first. <laughs> uh, fight clubs, crimes, and more. Oh, Fight Club. Hey, we don't we don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> um, I'm I'm actually interested, uh, Skate. Like uh, from the little research I've done, you're mm -hmm. relatively new to composing and music. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested in your like origins and like how you got started in um in music and and what inspired you to to get into it and make the music that you do make. Yeah, which is like really unique and. Oh, thanks. Um. So yeah, I started playing guitar when I was a kid, like. I don't know, 11 or 12. I don't want to count how many years ago that was. 20 something years ago. Uh, you don't, you don't have to admit age. You don't have to admit age. Just move on, move on. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Quickly move on. Uh, I'm giving you the out. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And I, um, uh, play guitar. Just kind of did nothing, you know, for forever. Was in a couple bands and whatnot, you know, nothing crazy. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and I guess a little backstory there. I, I just rented this little apartment that was like, 300 square foot. I don't think it was like a legal apartment. It was like someone had walled off like a, a room and like just put a door down. So there was no like windows or anything. And the plumbing was like kind of uh, just there like openly, I guess. But uh, anyway, I'm living in this like little 300 square foot cell and I'm like, I got to do something. I'm going crazy, you know? And I watched like a couple of videos on how the silent hill music was made. And uh, one of them's from a Avith uh, Ortega and the other guy, I can't remember, but yeah, those kind of got me like kind of made it tangible to where like, Oh, that's how you do it. And I sort of like, it seemed like it went from like a magical like thing that like I would never be able to be able to unravel to like a thing that like was pretty, you know, seemed kind of straightforward. So I just sort of got uh, a DAW and just kind of started doing it. Uh, a DAW is a, or a DA is a digital audio workstation for people who don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. One thing that, uh, one thing that's really interesting to me, right? I actually didn't know that you only just now started producing because I, we've been, uh, we've been hanging out a bit outside of mm -hmm. the, of this show and all that. Uh, and I, I did like watch you work on music. I did watch you work on sound effects and other stuff for, your new uh, another project you're working on Namada mm -hmm. Numada how mm -hmm. do you say that holy fuck I've been uh, saying Numada Numada <laughs> I have no idea I either way <laughs> I, I mean just seeing you like I've just been seeing you like tinkering around uh the that one time we were in a call and I I showed you like some fucking thing I figured out uh mm -hmm. like with Patro and FL Studio oh yeah and then you just started playing and it felt really natural it felt like you've been doing it for a really long time thank you that's really interesting <laughs> have you been uh have you been playing keyboard like did did you learn keyboard as a kid or something oh no I know you said guitar but like when when you were like playing those notes and everything I was like damn. This dude knows. This, oh. this dude knows. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I, I, um, I, I used to, I used to live in this like condemned uh, trailer like a long time ago that had like a piano in it that <laughs> had like five keys that worked, and I would just bang around on that. But like, uh, that was really just for noise stuff. So, so really, you were just you were just playing the same five keys, and I was too stupid to realize. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the five ones that I know. Oh, yeah. But. <laughs> no, I used, to, I used to take around on that a little bit. That was like in my early 20s, I guess. But then like, yeah, I really didn't start playing keyboard a lot until I started, you know, 
after the pandemic, you know, happened, I started like I got a little like key step thirty seven or whatever. And then, oh yeah, the the I I know what you're talking about that little <laughs> travel size uh, yeah. MIDI keyboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, everybody has one of those somewhere. It's so tiny, it's terrible. <laughs> oh my god, no, it's fine, it's fine. No velocity, no problems. You're good. <laughs> so. I'm kind of interested in then how you developed your like style um, of music that you make because uh, I I mean I assume it's inspired by like you, you're just you've just described two different living scenarios that sound like incredibly hellish and uh, <laughs> I imagine that has influence on your on the music uh, I just go- googled it but uh, Google uh, classes your genre as Argentinian trap but uh, I don't think that's, that's yeah that's it. Uh- <laughs> What is that? Wait, is that what shows up when you when you type out like cicada, cicada sirens? sirens yeah. Wait, does well, it is is that just like the fucking? That's oh. like the knowledge panel on the on the right. Oh my right. god, dude! The knowledge panel is so fucking stupid. I love it. Bless oh. it. Bless it. Bless its fucking heart. <laughs> the knowledge panel on like Bandcamp or something or no? No, no this is just on Google. This is like oh. the the one that comes Jeez. up for cicada sirens. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm just interested in like uh like you you like mentions um Silent Hill and I. I can definitely like feel the inspirations coming from Silent Hill. Um, but just like more generally, like like how did you how did you like once you started making music, you realized like this is the kind of stuff I want to make. I guess this like the the style of stuff I I the way I got into doing it was like, I, I have like a very limited palette of, I mean, I know like basic, like my chords and then, you know, some extended chords and my scales and, you know, just general stuff. And I can play like, okay ish. So like, I figured, you know, I can just cover it up with a bunch of bullshit, you know what I mean? And like, uh, <laughs> and make it sound better, you know? So like, that's how, sort of how it started was like, I just sort of kept putting like delays and, and, and reverbs and just distortion all over everything. And the more I did that, the less good I had to play. <laughs> so uh, it just sort of like became like a thing that I got really into doing was just sort of doing as little as I possibly can physically, and just sort of hoping the effects carry. <laughs> you know. Well, you've made it. You've done a very convincing job. Then, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would have to say. absolutely. And also, you say that, but when you, I, I like I said, I've seen you produce music. It, you you talk about it like you like you're not doing it on purpose. There is like there is purpose to the madness. You like when you distort when you do all your fucking effects. There is logic there. So um, I don't know if you're just like doing whatever. You, you you're yeah. selling yourself pretty damn short. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Like I guess there's just things that I really enjoy the sound of. I guess and like yeah, a lot of times whenever uh you know I'm out and about or whatever, like I'll hear something. And then I sort of like try to think about it, like if I could recreate that, like musically, not like exactly, but recreate the feeling of it or the recreate how I, you know, hmm. yeah, how I'm how I'm feeling a, a about feeling, the, yeah, you're you're a, you're a feelings uh, focused producer. <laughs> I, I feel like I've seen that a lot, like with people. Some some uh, music producers are more technical. Mm-hmm. Some music producers are more. Um, like they 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 chase feelings Mm -hmm. both are valid both have like so many good points to them it's just like you are you really go for the feeling and to go back to what you were saying like what one thing that i i think is like the golden rule of uh making music is always if it sounds good it is good oh definitely and i feel like just just having that in your head while you're producing or making any type of music you're are you're already you're always going to be on point you know yeah yeah i feel like a lot of people i mean you know get caught up in like things being perfect or whatever and like it just sort of like i don't know you can just do that like infinitely and and never release any music you know so like oh damn (laughs) me you know (laughs) it's easy to do yeah i don't think there's a single creative who doesn't relate to that feeling (laughs) yeah so you started like getting really into composing and making music during the pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. How long after that did you start working on Signalis? And like, how did that even happen? Like, what was the uh, impetus for that? Uh, I um, I don't know if I even got around to saying this in the last. I did like an interview a couple weeks ago or whatever, and I I'm very forgetful. But uh, 
yeah, the the it's like that was stuff like that was happening immediately. Like I, uh, I, all the stuff I I did for Signalis was the stuff that was really just meant for me. And like the Signalis folks found it and reached out to me, and they they wanted to like you know me to make music for the game or whatever, um, which didn't work out. Like I I just uh, was going through some stuff at the time, and uh, I just wasn't able to make like more stuff for them. So they just took they bought all the stuff I had made on. On SoundCloud, more or less, uh, up until like you know, you know, end of the game or whatever. So, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, I hadn't really had the intention of like having it in Signalis originally because I didn't know about it. You know, when I was making it, um, it just ended up being that they found me at just the right time. And that's actually wild. It, yeah, guess. that's crazy. That's actually wild. They just found like. <laughs> That is such insane luck to just oh, I know. Add, like just f- <laughs> when you're working on a project, just finding the perfect like everything is perfect, and then you just like ask the person like, "Hey, can I like license this?" And they're like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, yeah." That that's such a fucking <laughs> that is lightning in a bottle, crazy. Yeah, that, so, that was, holy that was my shit! Exact reaction. <laughs> Not lightning in a bottle. What's the? I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is or the expression. It's just like such a crazy, insane luck you know yeah it really is so most of the stuff for signalis were that you made was made before you even knew you were going to be a part of the game Mm -hmm. um how how does a thousand eyes and were we working with them before uh you even knew about the game or is it just happened that you guys were like doing similar stuff around that time and just because because it because like listening to the whole soundtrack and the game everything like it's so cohesive there's so much cohesion yeah cohesion and like it fits together it, it feels like such an airtight uh soundtrack <laughs> that's uh I, I feel like that's where you know gotta give credit to thousand eyes because like i i don't think i talked to him until after the game release um, oh my god <laughs> so like uh I, I knew they had like another composer or whatever, and I don't think we ended up meeting until yeah, a little while after the game release and everything. So like that's just him being insanely good at, <laughs> at what he does and like being able to just like get into the mood of things. Like exactly, I feel like his stuff is so like you were saying like complimentary. Like it just it all works together really well, and I think it's just all due to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm, tra- I'm, try- I'm trying to think. Go from here, because because I. I ca- yeah, no, no, sorry. I just I wrote a lot of I wrote, I wrote down some questions because I I kind of I kind of expected the because because it was just like my interpretation on the game is that like it all fits together so well like there's no way that this guy was you know brought on like you know, before or something like that or, or you know like that this was the stuff stuff not made directly for the game because like yeah. even um when I think about the save room like music. Oh and my god, the, yes. The the way in which that kind of embodies that like really classic Silent Hill like like mm-hmm. music mm-hmm. and also just does this like twist on it that uh that that just like makes it so even where you're supposed to feel safe you feel like maybe there's something going to be fucking out of coming out of the corner or something like that and just I don't know. Thanks. I mean, I mean, I definitely was thinking about a save room. Well, I guess because I named it that or whatever. But like, I definitely was thinking about it when I. Was, yeah. So it, it was like it was basically meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like I, when I started writing, I'm like, oh, this sounds like a save room, and then I named it that, and then, you know, all the other ones that are just named like crazy shit that I was reading on like Wikipedia or something, or, or weird, you know, half half a sentence or a thought that kind of got stuck in my head or something like that. They have like. No real <laughs> relation to like anything in the game, which I guess I don't know how how bad it's driving the devs crazy that you know there's a lot of fan art of like Elster smoking cigarettes and stuff because I named this song. Cigarette oh yeah, because you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Oh my god. Uh, one thing, one thing that I think is really funny because it, I, I'm from my experience in like audio department because i did i did do some stuff like in, at fucking game devs and stuff like one thing that constantly comes back when it comes to music is people will just dive into their old projects mm-hmm. 
and just basically reuse stuff from their old projects into like current projects where they can fit Mm -hmm. and i feel like i feel like that's that's kind of ish what happened yeah i mean like i guess like if i were if i were to like go back to whenever i first started making this the music or whatever like i would basically make a track every friday i mean this might be a lie i mean i don't know but i I probably could go on to soundcloud and look but i think i made one of those every week um for like Mm. you know 10 or 15 weeks or whatever i don't know how many tracks that did but and it was just sort of like a I don't know. I just, I didn't really have any intent with like what I was doing. I just sort of like whatever started to happen whenever I was writing, I'm like, okay, we're doing that. And, and yeah, you just of, gotta, you know, you, when, when the creativity gets there, you gotta fucking hold it by the balls and <laughs> tug it, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How's, yeah. um, how's that differ? How's, how's that differ from now when, cause nowadays you've been working on Pneumata or <laughs> yeah. Mata. Yeah. Uh, how does that differ now that you hack, you actually have somebody giving you instructions and themes and uh, uh, like a, a, a vibe? Like yeah. how, how does that differ from just writing on your own now that you have to have like these rules? I've been like really, really, really lucky that nobody's asked me to do uh, anything too far out of my wheelhouse, I guess. Like, three things that I've been working on recently are all just sort of like, cause I worked on Signalis, you know, and they're like, Oh, I know Signalis. And then like, I just got hired, you mm. know what I mean? Like, and they just like, like my work, I guess. So like, um, it really, I have like a lot of creative control over most of the things I've been doing. Like I know on, um, this game I'm working on, uh, called the end of nowhere. And there's some specific like sounds that he asked for, uh, that I was able to work in and stuff like that. Or, um, you know, so it's sort of just small requests most of the time, but usually it's just sort of still doing kind of whatever I want most of the time. Mm. Do you mind if I ask what the what the three projects are? Because I know Nomada, I don't know about the other two. Yeah, just real quick. Sorry. Oh no, you're all good. Uh, so yeah, Nomada, um, end of the yeah, the end of nowhere, which is like an Alaskan horror uh, game that I'm working on with uh, mm-hmm. James Thistleton as a co co composer. Um. And uh, I've I've did like three three or four ish tracks for for Dread Weight, like the visual novel. It's a sequel to Cooking Companions, which was like a, a horror visual novel thing. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, all of them like even like Dread Weight, which I felt I, in my head I thought a visual novel would be much different or like it would be like a really specific thing. But they I had some like creepy sounds I got off a of shortwave radio, and they're like. Yeah, work yeah, with that. You know I mean? we, so, talk, we talked about this number number stations and shit. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many cool sounds. Like if you like there's a online, if you Google it, there's like an online shortwave radio thing. And like I get so many sounds and textures just from that. And uh, mm-hmm. that's one of the that dude, that's one of the things like you told me about that, and I was immediately like, oh God, I gotta sample this. Like I gotta actually record some of this number radio stuff. Oh, it's great. It's such an interesting thing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's super cool. I mean, like, there's, like, different, like, flavors or textures of static that are on there, too, that are yeah, dude, insanely yeah. useful. Just, like, the different tones and the colors that you can get just from that. I remember, I think it was Beast from the Earth that you, mm-hmm. that you showed me from your SoundCloud. Yeah. And, like, with those, like, weird, like, Christian, like, uh, uh, <laughs> like, hymns. Was that the one? Yeah, yeah. It had, like, yeah. a preacher it's so some, creepy yeah. yeah there's a station out of nashville or near nashville that plays like some old like 50s or 60s like church show or something just like on repeat and it's it's uh it just sounds amazing like church is so creepy it's it really worth is. sampling for horror <laughs> <laughs> absolutely is but yeah i love all that like sort of i if i had money <laughs> you know in space i'd love to get into more of the analog kind of uh, stuff like that, like having like my actual an actual like shortwave radio set up in here would be mm-hmm. super nice. Yeah, it would definitely add like that that little color from the like just add a little color to the tone of those recordings, mm-hmm. and that's always something special. You gotta chase those little fucking details with the <laughs> colors, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Color of sound, dude. I swear to God, the color of sound is something that clients will ask of you, and you're just like. They're like, oh, can you make it blue? And you're like, motherfucker, it's audio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I definitely get what you mean. Like, it makes sense, like, in your head, but you it can't makes, make it. Make, but you, you can't know. make, yeah. You, like, when you tell it to other people, it's like, that doesn't make sense to those guys, you know? Yeah. 
I think everybody's their own specific brand of crazy. You know what I mean? So, oh but, God, yeah, it doesn't absolutely. Translate. I don't trust anybody that says they're not fucking crazy. Everybody's a bit crazy. <laughs> um, you work on so many horror projects, and I've seen like your because uh, uh, we did talk about horror movies a lot, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Do you ever pull from those like? horror movies from the 80s because i know like oh, yeah. I, I know we talk a lot about those goofy like rawhead Re- i think we talked about <laughs> rawhead rex at one point i can't remember just like a bunch yeah. of random shit like ha- d- does any of that stuff inspire you or like in your work or is it mostly like a lot of the video game soundtracks and, oh like how they do their soundtrack uh, yeah absolutely i mean yeah i'm probably more inspired by movies than i am by anything else um because mm-hmm. like oh you know of course i you know owe, owe a lot of money to the silent hill soundtracks you know for just ripping them off or whatever but i'm also ripping off like <laughs> john carpenter quite a bit like the the soundtrack for the fog is oh like, my god tremendously the, inf- influential somebody on somebody just listening to this just heard the fog put their hands in the air and just went oh my god somebody mentioned the fog <laughs> you know holy shit what a yeah, bang yeah. <laughs> it's so good all that all those little, like <laughs> simple piano they're like the sort of note clusters that he kind of hangs out on mm-hmm. like i know he's like you know known for like his his soundtrack work and stuff and like people kind of like take like a lot of sense wave influence from him i guess but like the piano work he did was just outstanding and like this as simple as it gets but it just like is is so fucking effective simplicity is so important though yeah. it, it's worth not thinking too hard sometimes especially when it comes to music sometimes yeah. just chasing a feel like chasing a feeling a feeling doesn't have to be complicated a feeling can yeah. be simple you know yeah. Uh I I know you list I, I think we talked about it follows oh, um God. disaster one. piece. Yeah. Uh that soundtrack mm. does it uh, were you uh, were you inspired by that? Cuz I know we talked a little bit about uh it's it follows and its soundtrack at yeah. one point. Yeah. I mean like definitely like on that one like the, the the sort of like really analog sound and like a lot of it sounding kind of like um it has like a, its own like sort of like why for vibe to it like it's a, a piece of music that was just found somewhere <laughs> you know what i mean like it just sort of like oh i i, I see what you mean yeah it, it just feels like uh it just feels very real or whatever and like it's a i don't know it has like a very analog uh aspect to it that i really like i mean yeah definitely that one um the uh it's like the, an old like ghost uh movie called the full circle or the haunting of julia like that one i've never huge heard for me. of any of those <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, the changeling's pretty big for me. Um, oh shoot, I love change. That's the thing with you. I swear to God, every time we talk about horror movies, you just pull out some fucking thing I've never <laughs> even heard of, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" Oh man, and your inspirations when it comes to horror run super deep. But a- apart from horror, do you ever like? Do you ever think about maybe wanting to do something that isn't horror? Is there like something you would like to challenge yourself with when it comes to composing? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> i would like to remain uh, in my lane unchallenged yeah, I, was, I, was, I was i was like waiting for like putting your head in the ring for high fire rush 2 or something you know like yeah oh, yeah yeah just uh i want to i want to go and make some dance dance revolution tunes <laughs> uh i mean like i probably could I, I maybe could get into like sci-fi or something like a little bit if it had like some horror elements to it but like mm. i guess signal is just that i guess but yeah, probably not. I don't want to go anywhere. Like, uh, you know, I just want to do horror forever. Like, I, I just want to be on. Yeah, I definitely want to be on those guys that just <laughs> does nothing but horror. Like, horror, dude. I get it though. I, I mean, fucking love horror so much. It, it's also it's also so deep in the the way you could you can uh, you can go with it as well. Because like, mm-hmm. despite like Signalis being this very like heart like PSX inspired horror game. There are like moments, especially in the soundtrack, where it's actually quite beautiful, especially with the piano riff that uh, you guys use throughout the the, the game, and that that sh- that is shows up as the motif. And um, I, yeah. I remember in some of the later scenes when you expand on it, it, uh, it becomes quite l- like lush and beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It feels like overwhelming in such a I don't know how like not overwhelming in a way where it's like you know like that <laughs> where it's like too much it, it, yeah. it becomes overwhelming but like in an emotional way where it just it feels right you yeah know? 
that for me, like that's one of the most important uh, aspects for horror for me, like having it have like some empathy to it or, you know, have some feeling to it or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely like schlocky, you know, dumbass horror movies and stuff, but the ones that have like, you know, some heart to it are the ones that I like the most. And um, yeah, just like, I, I think there's a lot of beauty and horror and stuff that like a lot of people on surface level just don't really think about or, or maybe dismiss and stuff. How like, you know, heartfelt, uh, it's just, just such a scary genre can be. You know? I, I, dude, I, I feel so happy you said that because that's one thing I feel like I have to explain to people, especially my mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever, my mom's always like, "Why are you always wearing those scary fucking t-shirts?" And I'm <laughs> like, "Cause the, cause like, there's, there's like, emotions are important, and I think horror movies are the most genuine and sincere." like genre you yeah. know it's literally hard on your sleeve type stuff mm-hmm. like you can't be scared by not showing emotion yeah know? yeah definitely I'm gonna bring it back to your current work and how it like contrasts with the stuff you did for signalis not knowing you're making it for signalis like uh if if working with a game development team uh like from the jump and then like maybe sending you like builds or screenshots like helps with your process and like like you're like oh i want to do this kind of song for like you know the creepy church that the character goes to or something like that you're like oh this could this this is the vibe for it yeah like on the uh the end of nowhere like uh wit sends me like the the game dev sends me like loads of cool screenshots and it's so inspiring like because it'll just be like it'll even just be something like he did some some new kind of model for the snow or some shit, you know, but like in my head, it just kind of gets me there immediately. And like, I, it's just so, so important. I feel like to be able to like see something and then like emotionally kind of get in there and then, and then I'm able to make the music pretty easily once I'm kind of in it, you know, but yeah, that's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's so nice. I, I really have been enjoying that process. Cause it's, you know, b- before when I was working on the signal stuff, I would just be like in my own head thinking about stuff. I'm like, yeah, I can, I can, I can do some of that. And I sort of like think of some weird shit or I'd hear my neighbors washing machines of the wall <laughs> and I'd make a track. Uh, if it's not horror stuff or, or, or game visuals, like sometimes it's like random sounds like that or like honestly great influence. If you were force gun to your fucking head, right? Temp like right on your temple and you had to do another <laughs> genre of music, what would you choose? Uh and I'd you pro- were forced to do a full soundtrack. <laughs> oh, a soundtrack. I was going to yeah, say <laughs> full soundtrack. Full soundtrack. You got to choose. Gun to your temple. <laughs> I was going to say whenever whenever I was out of high school, I, I played uh I played uh, lead guitar for like a country singer for a bit. <laughs> oh, so- that's awesome. <laughs> Maybe I would maybe I would just do some some Nashville stuff or something. I'm pro- I'm too shitty of a guitar player now to do any of that, so probably not that. If I had to do that, like dude, a- honestly, guitar is like riding a bike. I mean, any <laughs> instrument is. I feel like you you would grab a guitar right now and you could probably you could probably remember a few tricks. You know? <laughs> I hope so. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. But if I had to do like a a soundtrack like gun to my head, and I had to do like another genre. Um, God, I mean, I'd be so out of my element, but I'd love to do like a an RPG or something because I grew up playing like yeah. Chrono Cro- or Chrono Trigger, excuse me. Yeah, Mono. everybody's clapping. <laughs> everybody's clapping. I'll, I'll name off games for the next twenty minutes. We can fill all the let's air go, with this. Let's go. Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like those early games were kind of what got me to play guitar and like get into music to begin with. Like Final Fantasy VIII, you know, um, so huge. Like I just like wanted to play. Mm. <clears throat> excuse me all that shit on guitar you know so like a lot of those ps1 games like ps1 rpgs have a lot of really fucking beautiful mm-hmm. drones and ambient music like oh, i yeah. feel like you would fuck you would kill it at that too <laughs> those guys are so impressive like i i ridiculously impressive yeah i've been listening to the chrono cross soundtrack this week i've never played oh, it oh my god th- uh, we I, we are gonna have a talk after this because that is actually <laughs> one of my favorite games of all time oh, oh hell man. yeah so good right <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> yeah like that kind of stuff like i i'm sure like i could maybe fake it a little bit but it would be a, be a fun genre to explore mm-hmm also, I got to apologize. Earlier, you said, like, oh, I would like to only stick with horror. Uh-huh. Uh, I guess this is a good time as any to say that you will be providing some music <laughs> for uh, Perilous Storytelling Subliminal Space, which is 
I don't know if it's out yet when this is coming out. January? Do, do you, this is coming out before? Jan- I mean, this is... Co- uh, it depends what week of January, because everything's coming out in January. So, <laughs> whatever. But you will be providing some music for that. And uh, unfortunately, that's not horror. <laughs> I mean, it's it's horrifically I mean. stupid, but... <laughs> Uh, it's not horror, so uh, you're fucked now. I'm so fucked. Yeah, fantasy I'm, sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even really thought about like how to even do that yet. I'm, I'm excited to kind of. Oh, we'll, get we'll in talk a about bit. it. We'll 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 we'll, we'll collab. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll you know me and you. We'll, we'll figure something out. We'll figure something <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we will. I can uh, I can share my screen. You can watch me write, and I'll just be like, "How do you turn this thing on again?" <laughs> you know, I feel like. You know. And then I'll scream, you fucking old man. <laughs> All right. I think, we, I think we got time for maybe one more question. Um, oh, I'm sure. going to, I'm going to lay the ground just cause the episode this is going to appear on is like a, a first one. And we talk about a game of the year. So I'm just wondering, Skater, uh, if you have any pick for your game of the year. This oh, year. Can I nominate uh, Daggerfall for game of the year. I, Daggerfall? Oh, you've been playing that? I've been playing Daggerfall so much. Yeah. It's the only thing I've been playing for <laughs> for months. If, uh, any, if there's any game that you could play for months, though, it's fucking Daggerfall, right? Uh, yeah, it, Daggerfall uh, has one of the biggest world maps of any game, I think. Yeah, it's, right? in, it's insane. Isn't it ridiculous? Isn't it like... Yeah, it's probably one of the bigger... I guess, yeah, up until like no man's sky or whatever came out i guess but i'm so behind on new games i think the the last like new game i played was uh i beat Baldur's gate which i really enjoyed mm-hmm. um it it was very overwhelming though because like i oh yeah oh Baldur's gate 3 yeah 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 it's, it's just uh everywhere you look there's just something that you can do for a long time so it's very uh <laughs> you know it's Whereas like Daggerfall, because it's so procedurally generated, you know, you can kind of just do whatever, do whatever missions. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Because like all the yeah. missions bes- besides like the main stuff is procedurally generated. Whereas like Dag- or, or uh, Baldur's Gate 3, like it's all just so handcrafted. You can just find like a really great quest anywhere. So it's it's a little overwhelming, I guess. I, it's ridiculously expansive. Yeah, it really is. I, I want to play Alan Wake, t- Alan Wake 2. Um, mm. everybody's been telling me to play it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You, if should, that... you should wait on that until they fix the fucking. Oh bugs, yeah, though. yeah. Oh my god. Um, I don't know what else came out this year. I mean, I'm so. Oh, Resident Evil Four remake. Oh shit! Yeah, I'll just answer that for game of the year. Ah, yeah. there you go. There we yeah, go. <laughs> we did it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that Resident Evil Four is amazing. Like I, I. I was kind of skeptical of it because you know. Yeah, I, just- dude, I, I was. Oh, I mean, that's a spoiler. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil because later is uh, when I we talk about our game of the year. So I'm, I'm gonna. Never mind. Okay. I, I didn't say anything about Resident Evil Four remake. That's a spoiler <laughs> for the later in the episode. <laughs> perfect all right well thank you so much for uh thank you so much for coming on oh yeah um any final words thousand eyes uh ha 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 that's so good thousand eyes what about you cicada (laughs) (laughs) oh my god uh (laughs) where can we find you and what do you want to is there anything you want to talk about like new projects coming on uh i've I talked about most of the stuff I'm already doing. Uh, there's a few things later on that, that kind of aren't gathered up enough to be anything yet. So um, definitely should have some new stuff by the beginning of the year. But yeah, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Cicada Sirens or, or whatever. But uh, And I don't think I'm anywhere else. Uh, Spotify? Oh, yeah. Spotify. <laughs> <It's not cloudy. laughs> check, check, check out the Bandcamp if it still exists by the time oh, this releases. Bandcamp. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Cringe. Uh Cringe band camp moment. Uh, uh. A ton of fun. Wow, 
Cameron, Cameron. What, what an excellent Cameron. interview from the Signalis Composers. And now on to the community segment of the podcast. Welcome to the community half of this episode of Press Start Turbo. Uh, this is the segment in which we'll be taking your guys' suggestions for which games we should play, and then we play them. Unfortunately, we didn't have that because it's the first episode, so we're going to talk about our favorite games of 2023. I can't believe I had to look at the year, dude. What a moron. 2023. Did you just say 2022? I, I almost did. That's why I looked at the year. But specifically, we're going to look at games that have a release this year, not games that we played this year. Yes. Yeah. We'll also be looking at the games that you guys played in your favorite games. Well, I won't, but I'm forcing you. One no. will turn a blind eye. The others will fucking d pay attention to what you have to say. Three of us are honest. One of us tells lies. You must discern who the imposter is. It's crazy. My favorite game of the year was Haze for the PlayStation 3. So I don't know. That didn't come out this <laughs> Ooh, year. That game has so many slurs. That game has one. It only has one. It only Ooh, has conservative. one. Conservative. Which one? The F slur, yeah. It's the one you said earlier, dumbass. <laughs> I don't ever say one slurs. One of the ones you said earlier. I don't ever say slurs. Never in my life have I said a slur. So we're lucky enough to have Brendan here. And he, Brendan will take us into the depths of the slop and sludge and gruel of the video game industry. The fucking nightmare video games that have released this year. Let's talk about that. With a special segment, Slop versus Bob. <laughs> uh, yeah! <laughs> Can we just call the community yeah! section that instead? Slop versus Bob. Bob. Slop, slop or Bob. We, 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 no, let, let, let's, let, 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 let's actually dive in. Before we dive into the games of the year let's dive into the slop and sludge of the, the year. slop and sludge of the year so i i i i enjoy and i love playing video games that feel like they shouldn't exist or that feel that they, they feel like they're incredibly bad um and for this year there was a lot of slop and sludge and slime that came out this year <laughs> uh and some of these games i have 10 games here that i made a list of that i uh either enjoyed or hated oh my god that's so many uh, i played more i cut it I down i didn't even know there was that <laughs> Wait, is this like all that came out this, this year? This is this year. Ten games that came out this year no that I played that are way. Slop or Sludge. Um, what? So Slop versus Sludge is a very uh, Brendan-ism. Uh, whenever I play a PS3 or 360 game, I like to consider it Slop or Sludge. I.e., I'll give you an example. The video game Mind Jack on the Xbox 360 is uh, Sludge. It's, it's not fun to play. It's awful. But a video game like Condemned is slop uh because it's still crusty and bad uh but it's fun as hell and it's got uh some good things going for it for for this year i have not 10 games because for some reason i wrote pizza tower on this list uh nine games that i would consider slop or sludge so i'd like to pique uh your interest from the audience but also the interest of my co-hosts here uh your thoughts on these video games we'll start off with the first one here a uh, very beginning of the year a video game came out called uh forespoken oh boy oh is that slop okay Here's the, I, I remember playing the demo and the demo was really bad, but mm -hmm. I heard that with later patches, it got okay. way better. So the, the best way to dedicate whether or not it's slop or sludge is in my mind's eye. Oh my God. If you see this video game and it's going to end up in the bargain bin for $5 at your local GameStop, it's definitively in the slop or sludge conversation. Right. Mm. Is, is Forspoken that cheap? I feel like it's not yet. Oh, it'll be there. Still 100 and 120 bucks. No, but like it's this year. It is It is something that is I inevitably going to end up in the bargain yes. bin. Oh, oh, of course it is. Of course. Okay. Forspoken, absolutely. All, it didn't. Then Forspoken closed the fucking uh, Luminous Productions, like the studio that made they it. They let them or? do the DLC, and then they closed it. Are you serious? Yeah. So they had they were contracted. They were contracted to do the DLC, and then they were like, "Fucking shut up, you're done." In the first ten to twenty minutes of Forspoken, before you're introduced into the magical world, um, your apartment is literally on fire, and you have this bag of money that your character is saved up, and your character can't just grab the bag of money. They're just like yelling, "I gotta get my cat." I gotta get Homer. I gotta get Homer. I gotta get my cat. And your character is just like standing there with no impetus, uh, not able to like grab the bag of money that they've been saving because the money needs to be destroyed for plot reasons. Are you serious? So regarding regarding the slop and sludge, um, for spoken actually is followed. For spoken is actually followed by a game that also. Um, weirdly enough, this year was very big for a women in your head calling you a stud muffin, but also really big for having an arm that doesn't shut the fuck up. Oh my Ugh. God. It's fucking, oh, uh, what's atomic it called? Atomic heart. Atomic heart. 
more like atomic fart. Now, to, to speak about atomic heart, like first off, before before like we really dive deep into this lasagna of atomic heart, I want to by no means say that I don't think it's a bad video game. What I do dislike about the video game is how so much of its plot and how many of its uh, storytelling conveyances are directly through your character not shutting the fuck up, talking to their hand while you're roaming around the map, and it is like a nonstop deluge of information wherein it constantly keeps spouting verbal prose to the point where your character and your hand are verbal diarying at each other to the point where I legitimately thought the criticism against Forspoken where it had a snark meter built into the game is more tenuous when it comes to Atomic Heart because Atomic Heart shut doesn't shut the fuck up more so than Forspoken. Jesus so, Christ. Brendan, would you say that Atomic Heart is the slop to Forspoken Sludge? Ooh. It is. Um, it, it definitely is because the game itself is more fun and and better put together than Forspoken, um, but it still has the, the, oh my God, will you not shut the fuck up? Please, God, let shut the fuck up. That's the reason why I dropped the Atomic Heart was because I, I, I remember playing it and the entire time, the fucking, it's so weird because the, the, the protagonist said what I was thinking, but because he was saying it, I was getting pissed. Crispy critters, this situation is freaked up. You know, the fucking, your hand doesn't shut up. And the entire time I'm like, oh my God, just shut up. Your hand, man. well, your hand doesn't shut up. And it's at a point where like it continuously repeats the same yes. dialogue, but in different yes. ways. But the thing is. The main character also tells the hand to shut up, but when the main character does it, he's like, shut the fuck up! And he starts, like, having a fucking fit over it, and I hated it so much. And then the fridge wanted to suck my dick, and that's when I said, you know what? It did I'm have a good. horny fridge. I really liked that there were multiple horny fridges at the beginning of 2023 video games. What the fuck are you talking about? What? Hi-Fi Rush had a horny fridge. Was Hi-Fi Rush fridge horny? Yes. I thought it was just, like goofy no it was horny for you one of them was the tutorial fridge uh, was like all about like i want to play i, I know everything about you I'll, I'll help you however i can let's, let's go back to slop jumping <laughs> to the next slop game let me let me get some opinions on this one wanted dead yes th that's wanted that's dead? sludge that is sludge wanted, wanted dead, dead is sludge, is sludge. however I will pose that Wanted Dead is actually amazing slop if you... It, oh, yeah. It, it is amazing slop if you um, utilize the easy mode they've built into the game where your character is forced to wear cat ears the entire playthrough, but the game is easier. Oh, they did the chicken head? What, I, I think that game is... It, it's going to be like... It's going to have a resurgence as so bad it's good eventually, and I, I, I'm sure about it because that game is fucking weird it's weird yet awesome my only problem ended up being i loved everything you could do it's devil's third core i loved everything you could do it has um it has so many yakuza like moments wherein um you can do like a mini game where you eat ramen but it's a rhythm game it has karaoke a rhythm game it has a claw machine game built into yeah. it but also you're this it, it, it's eight foot tall giant -esque cop who's like gunning down and slopping down enemies who are either a paramilitaries or b infected with nanobots or or they're androids that have like gone bad what the fuck oh dude wanted dead is like it's it's my sludge pick of the year remember sludge sludge i.e negative slop i.e good okay then it's my slop Rengen, uh where does uh where does the cyberpunk the dlc fall on this so, cyberpunk dlc uh i don't care Okay. That's not slop or sludge. What? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> it, I wouldn't call it slop or sludge. I played through. I played through a good amount of it, and it does improve the game uh, somewhat. But also, I did not care enough to finish it. I might go back and finish it. That sounds like slop to it's me. Just, it, 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 slop inherently isn't mediocre in my head. Like, I mean, it is, but also, I, I, I don't know. I put it probably at sludge. It's a specific slop and sludge is such a specific thing, but I feel like. People can understand just from hearing. It's like Booba and, and Kiki. It's Booba and Kiki for bad video games. Let's keep going. Maybe I have a lower opinion of Cyberpunk than you guys do. Then. Oh yeah, no, I like the game on release. So like, I'm I'm I'm, I'm fucked. We're lethargic about it. I think I we see. just don't care. Yeah. Okay. Next up, Crime Boss Rock Hay City. <laughs> oh, that oh, came out. Oh my <laughs> god, I forgot that game came Holy out. Wow. Shit. Crime Boss Rock Hay City is a first person co op video game, but it has, um, I, I don't think most people know this about the single player of that video game, is it's got a single player mode wherein you take control of different characters that randomly generate, and it's a full roguelite mode. I have seen that, and it's, it's like. It's roguelite payday. It, it has like a bunch of cutscenes with, um, uh, it has, uh, what's his fucking uh, name? Uh, fucking uh, Chuck Norris. It has Chuck Norris. Vanilla yeah, that's Ice. the one. 
Wait, Vanilla Ice is in that Vanilla Ice is in that game, yeah. Mike Walker is in that game. Yeah. Yeah. I knew Michael. I, I knew Rogue was Danny in that Trejo. game. Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo is in that game. Danny Glover is in that game as well. Yeah, Danny Glover, right? Yeah. Who's the main guy? I can never remember the main actor's name for it. I remember watching the trailer of that uh, of that game when it dropped on YouTube and, and looking at the comments and everyone just being like, dude, it's so fucking cool that they're singing along to the song while it plays in this awesome slow motion vi This video, this game's going to be the coolest fucking thing ever. Michael Madsen. In. That's right. Yeah, Michael, Michael Madsen, Madsen. That's the one. It is all. Is it, it is also incredibly funny. And DH as well. Uh, oh, it's also incredibly funny as like a payday like um, that. It also has uh, the voice and actor for Chains from Payday in it as a character, and he literally carries most of the cutscenes in the single player mode. It's Damien. Uh, what is it? Dam Damien Poitier. I probably pronounced that name wrong. Uh, but he plays Chains um, in Payday. Br Br Brendan, did you finish this game? I try to, well, because the roguelike mode restarts and then you upgrade your character and then you have to redo it all over again. I got to a certain point, but it's basically you just fighting like, oh, Danny Trejo bad, take his territory. Awesome. Okay, Vanilla Ice bad, take his territory. Awesome. Cool. Damn. Oh, they man. were so bold as to say Vanilla Ice bad. First guy to do it. Um, It's 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 legitimately wild <laughs> for that video game as well. It's, it's legitimately wild that the multiplayer is actually much worse since it is a co-op, like it was sold as a co-op payday-like. Uh, so it's oh. It's funny that the single player is actually much more fun than the multiplayer ever could be. Wow. Oh, bless their heart. <laughs> Curse their heart, dude. So sludge? 100% sludge. 100% sludge. Especially since I believe they licensed Chuck Norris's voice, uh, but it was not him acting. It was AI. Oh, oh gross. Yeah, no, I saw that. They Everybody, for, for a while, people thought that Chuck Norris had, like, had a a weird voice actor impersonator, but then people learned later that it was like an AI doing it. And it's, it's it explains a lot and it kind of adds to the funny, but like, it, it's not good. It's bad, but it's kind of funny. Next up on the slot meter, Dead Island 2, yeah. because I wanted to talk about how Dead Island 2 was surprisingly huh. much better than I thought it would ever be. Yeah, I thought it was going to stink. And I had a really, really good time with it. I really enjoyed it. And I'm also huh. happy to see Dam Busters do more things. I feel like they're one of those game dev companies that um, the, the, they made Homefront the Revolution. Uh, they made Dead Island 2. And I feel like their next game is going to knock it out of the park because they're they're they're. It's, it's akin to how I felt about Dishonored, where it's a video game series where there's this ephemeral feeling that it's almost there. Right. There's something that's holding it back from like that uh, uh the, the yeah. unique and mystical 10 out of 10 perfect video game vibe and uh, it's still good um but it's 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 a step up from Homefront the Revolution so I'm very excited to see where they go next so, after that So Island wait two. I thought you're more positive on it do you still consider it slop then like it's still I still would consider it slop yeah I I think it treads the line Yeah it, it's like it, it's a great time but I don't think it's I don't think it hits I don't think it hits those uh, really good marks. I don't know how to explain it. It's it's part of the reason for me is it doesn't it it, it, it kind of waffles between um, what I call like the looter shooter mechanics, wherein you know we talked about this on the news. Um, it, it waffles a little bit between them, where it's got like the dead on loot rarity, but yeah. doesn't make it fully interesting enough for you to dedicate enough time to care. So it kind of treads the line for me on that front. But then like the meat stuff, the gore, the the music, and the story, the story's kind of meh. But like the actual like punchiness of hitting a zombie in it is great. It's it's I've heard it described as like the quintessential like 360 game. Oh, it where is. It feels it is. incredibly just like that era of games, which honestly had a bit of a resurgence this year. That's why I'd probably say it's 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 in that diamond slop category. Mm. It's it's diamond. right there at the tail edge. It's almost out of the slop. It's like top of the trash can. <laughs> Top of the it's breaching out of the video game womb, uh, but it's not quite out of there yet. Yeah, I, I like to think that I like to think that it's opening the womb up and just screeching at Stop. the same time. We are really Enough. going with this womb metaphor, huh? I want, I want this one to be over now. It's opening up and going. Ah, Next stop. up, uh, speaking of looter shooters, uh, Redfall. Redfall. Oh, that's sludge. that's gotta be sludge. The, the, uh, uh, how many of you have played Redfall? I have not. I, I have played not. it. Because was it with you? I think I think you played, played it with, it with me somebody. Once. Yeah, maybe. Brandon, I've watched you. I watched your stream of it. That's my like the maximum amount of like uh, yeah. interaction I've what had. What a fall from grace! Oh my god, what a stinky fucking game! Well, okay, hold up. 
It's worth bearing in mind that this was the first time the studio in particular handled a full-on release. Up until that point, they were a support studio, and they are almost definitely, if not confirmed already, definitely going to go back to that <laughs> now that Redfall is out. It, oh, so to be fair, like, it's a game that, it's a, it's a completely different genre from what they've ever tried before with, like, different, like... The only multiplayer they've ever had in an arcane game before was the invasion that they did in Deathloop, and that did not work very well anyway. So I disagree. I fucking loved it. Oh, I liked it, but I, what I mean is like with their the the networking and stuff. Like it oh, okay. was, I think it was very hodged together in a, in a in a like rather than being like a main resource pile. Uh, Arkane Austin did make Prey. Like they did develop Prey. It's just that a lot of the talent that helped make um, Prey left afterwards uh so well Red yeah because Fall, they're because their next next fucking next game was a looter was shooter Fall. live service yeah, yeah. Th- yeah. they're like fuck this i think it really was just doomed from the get-go though i mean again if we wanted to spend more time on this in the future we will with these uh, episodes but for now like I- i'd like to have done a lot of research and like um mm. seen what uh journalists have been like digging up about its development prior to talking about it but from what i've seen and absorbed tangentially a support studio jumping into their own full-time production with tools that weren't really cut out for this level of production for the very first time uh with without the experience required to get into it and without the time needed or the resources required it's like they they just it, it seems like mismanagement above all else like they were they it's were an incredibly ambitious game for their first outing like like you've got you've like a multiplayer fucking looter shooter open world left for dead like yeah with uh like a vault like with c- different character classes uh like like it's just ridiculous yeah, it's absolutely absurd to ask of a studio with so little experience. Uh, true that it was a major undertaking, and I, I'm not going to be like game dev lazy and bad, because I know that game dev, regardless of what you're doing, is a lot of I work. will! <laughs> and my my major complaints with the game are, A, it's, it's state at release, and then B, also, um, the, the presentation of the game itself also was incredibly lacking, which, uh, I mean, r- regarding any of Arcane Austin's work with it as well, like, uh, the, the video game majorly having no cutscenes, it all being in motion graphics and comics, mm. uh, the, the story itself not being, uh, just uh, d- 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 not knowing what the hell to do with it, um, the, the uh, kind of transition from, uh, prey and dishonored style maps that uh, the kind of imsim maps not working because mm-hmm. it's open world and then the loop being balls to the wall boring where you can have a meat yeah. gun but the meat gun is literally just what if we made an assault rifle but the stats were slightly better and it looked like a meat gun instead of doing anything interesting yeah it, it, all of this just it just screams of like lack of ability to do more and, well not even that but like there's no creative spark there like yeah. they they're not they're not um like i mean this is just like conjecture but like, I would just assume that like, you know, if you, if you've decided to work at a studio like Arcane, you want to work at a studio like Arcane for the reasons of like, that's what's wild games. too about Redfall is like saying that there's no spark, but then looking at some of the amazing art direction within oh, the game yeah. itself, if you're staring at like the, um, the very opening scene in Redfall where you yeah. get off of the ship and the, the medical vampires, which is what I'm calling them because that's what they are. They're medicine vampires. Um, did you know that by the way, in Redfall, that they they're all like the doctors who became vampires? You. No, they're di- they're a pharmaceutical mm. company that discovered vampirism. That's the story oh, of Redfall. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The 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 very beginning of Redfall with a really cool stylized cutscene going into leaving the ship that you're on, and then the waves around you have been frozen, and everybody is locked into this area. Yeah. The is an incredible visual. Was- the environment art was staggering at times. Yeah. But, but just then like, you get I, I, to the very first safe house and it's like motion comics where it's like, this lady's pregnant aunt. This pregnant person aunt. is the, the doctor. This person sells you the gear. Oops, we ran out of money to do anything. <laughs> so here are some motion graphics. I, I'm a huge Arcane fan, so I just could not bring myself to play it like Prey and Deathloop being one of my like favorite games. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's really sad to see. Oh, but they lunch. said they've stated they're going to fix it though. Oh, which I don't, I don't. Yeah, I, they are. It's happening, I, fellas. They, they have said they have said they want to bring Redfall. They have said um, in recent articles that they want to bring Redfall uh, up to like standards. Oh, but God. I think that it's also a video hey, game that is inherently broken from the get go. I've heard this. I've heard this tune before. I remember when Anthem said that they were going to do a 2.0. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, well, no, but don't you remember how like? 
the very the very quote unquote like I, I don't want to say the first game to do it, but the very first notable game to do that is No Man's Sky, and now everything's like, dude, dude, it's broken, but like we're totally gonna No Man's gonna Sky do it. it. They're gonna No Man's Sky this shit. Halo Infinite, yeah. it's gonna do a No Man's Sky. Just you wait. Fallout seventy six <laughs> is gonna do a No Man's Sky, which I mean, to its credit, so true. To its credit, seventy six is a lot better than where it is, and it is a fully comprehensible game now. I, I will say I like it. I enjoy it. I've read those articles around like Redfall uh, coming back, like like they're gonna fix it. And I think every article has ended with the, the person being like, I think they shouldn't. There's nothing There's nothing Man. salvageable there. I think they should cut their losses and move on to a different one. Speaking of cutting your losses and moving on to a different one, uh, I have three more games real Ooh. quick just to get through. Texas Chainsaw okay. Massacre, the video game. Well, I, I, what? That's a game that happened? That's the, it's Deadlight, right? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. it's weird too. Did, did, it's, is it dead now? It's it's kind of dying, but like that was going to happen with a yeah. specific. When you make a video, I mean, look at the Evil Dead, the game. When you make a video game based around a specific franchise, you only have enough room to work around in. It's an Evil Dead game. It, it died this year. Yeah. Evil Dead died this year. Yeah. Evil Dead died this year. Well, right after they tried to do like a player only battle royale mode for Evil it. Evil died tonight. Aww. Yeah. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, though, I mean, for what it was, I'm glad I played it during the, like, initial launch because it was a lot of fun, uh, being able to play as different, uh, like, the 5v3 structure is pretty I remember great. you kept talking about being, like, the number one grandpa in, uh, Oh, I love feeding America, grandpa. Right? Like, I love the, the mechanics of feeding grandpa yeah, playing is not Leatherface. Uh, Leatherface himself actually being more of a support character than the guy who gets all of the kills is a lot of fun, too, because, uh, Weird. the way that you... You, the way that you like discover survivors and kill them and the way that survivors can get away is a lot more interesting to me than Dead by Daylight but because of the way that it's so crusty because Dead by Daylight feels like it's so streamlined towards every game is get the generators get out or find the secret hatch whereas there are so yeah. many different win conditions in Texas Chainsaw Massacre that made it much more interesting to me huh. but Based around one singular movie franchise, you only have so much room to grow, and Dead by Daylight has Naughty Bear. So, realistically, which is better? Yeah, Naughty Bear! Um, so, slop then? Yeah, yeah, definitely definitely slop, and I, I wish it wasn't going to die, but, like, it's destined to die, unfortunately. It's, it's going to die. That's just how it is. Like, I'm excited for the Killer Clowns game. We all know. I can't we play all that know game. it's how, not happening. But how many of these Dead by Daylight clones have, like, Friday the 13th, fucking... Evil Fra did. No, that's not that's not fair. That's not fair. Friday the Thirteenth came out like I think it came out before, before Dead, Dead by Daylight. Daylight. Yeah. Oh, really? It, it's yeah. Oh. That game that game was like releasing around the same time as Dead by Daylight and Dead by Daylight. I mean, Friday might have won if it wasn't for the licensing issues with j the Friday franchise. A fun actual fact about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the video game, too, before I move on to the next one. Yeah. AEW, the wrestling company, had a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the video game wrestling match. And one of the one of the wrestlers won a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the video game championship belt, huh. which will never <laughs> be defended. Just it's now. just they, they, they he, he won a belt. Um, speaking of belts and speaking of hanging myself, uh, Gollum, the video game. Oh, <laughs> that would be so sad. You played that? I beat it. I beat oh it. Oh my god. god, you're a freak. You're a freak. I don't I know, know what the know last that. one is. Hell yeah. I don't know. I guess I do. It, it's going to be King Kong. No. I didn't play didn't, that one. You didn't play no. King Kong? You're not going to know oh, the last one. I feel one. like that one would be sludge. No, oh, I don't shit. give a shit no, about no, that one. Mind. That one's like mobile game oh. quality. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Dude, okay. the Gollum game was so tragic to see unfold because you could tell that it was it. Yeah, no, that was a studio that bit off a million times more than they could ever chew, and then cr and then were crushed under the weight of expectation and like I goals. Feel like it had it had no promise. It had no promise to begin yeah, well, with. I I know I know Billy, but that's part of the problem. Is it's like this is a this is a dev that had only ever made scoped projects before, and then they were like. Uh yeah, we can make it like a triple A quality thing, and then they fucking could not do that, and then they died. For, they died in their hubris. It's it's wild to think of that Gollum was also the, the the beginning of the end, like this deluge of video games that are all going to be related to Lord of the Rings that are all going to fail spectacularly. Like they're also mm. releasing that dwarven mm. Minecraft game or a crafting survival video game. Oh, that, oh that, no, yeah, that I haven't failed. heard about that. That's already out. Yeah, it's already out. The reviews oh, no. were incredibly oh, no. bad. <laughs> it's a uh, Epic Game Store exclusive. Uh, <laughs> it's oh, no. it's it's interesting to see like immediately once the Tolkien estate like is allowing all this shit 
um, seeing the deluge of slop coming out that is all just trying yeah. to cash in as hard as possible on the Lord of the Rings IP. It's Warhammer all over again. Oh, yeah. It reminds me, yeah, it reminds me a lot of Warhammer when Games Workshop was like, make any video game you want, whatever, dude. Mm. I, I mean, the, the biggest the biggest tell for me was seeing the difference between the cutscene, uh, like dialogue choices of E3 versus what we got and like seeing how downgraded it was in the final release. And it's just like, oh my God, they had to butcher this thing to get it out the door. This is so <laughs> I, fucked. What I loved about Gollum was going to prison and then escaping and then going back to orc prison and then escaping and then going to elf prison and then the game fucking ends. Wow. <laughs> if, 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 there are reports coming out of the studio that they were like, they had imposed uncompensated overtime. Oh, uh, with no way. Below minimum wage. No way. And, like dude. were created like a really toxic work environment. No, which, I don't believe uh, that. <laughs> Plus, it also it had like a tiny ass fucking budget as well. It was like fifteen million euros. Yeah, and um, yeah. Oh my god, again, that is like yeah, wow. Yeah, this is a this is a studio that w had never made a game of this scale before, and were completely unfunded to even try. <laughs> so like, I I mean I, I I'm sorry, but I also just think that the premise by itself is really dumb. Oh, dumb. And sure. Yeah. Who yeah. cares? I mean, I won't, I won't, I won't be, I won't deny that. Who out here wanting to play Ghulam? Not even Lord of Ring Ghulam, <laughs> like Tolkien Ghulam from book. It's true. Speaking of dumb and who cares, uh, the very last video game in my slop and sludge category here, Exoprimal. Oh, what the fuck is Exoprimal? Right. Exoprimal, right. the Capcom video game where you fight raptors that are summoned by the benevolent white face. Whoa. I forgot about Exoprimal. They just did a, they just did a Monster Hunter collab. What? I know. I thought about re-downloading it, actually. You can play as a, as a dinosaur or... You can play as a dinosaur now with the skin. Dinosaurs. What's tragic about Exoprimal is that launch. Um, the the biggest problem that I had with the game as as something sloppy that I played was that the the progression is tied directly into the multiplayer. So the first hour or two, you only get the simple boring maps with the simple boring objectives because you have to get to a certain point in the story to unlock the game modes that are fun. Which is one of the worst things a video game oh can my do God. is lock the fun behind not fun fighting boring dinosaurs before you can get to the good shit. For a multiplayer game, I mean. There's a game that did that, and I can't remember what it is. Was it Lemnus Gate or some shit that did the exact same thing where you had to play until you hit a good... Oh, no, it's Starship Troopers. Oh, Starship yeah. Starship Troopers oh did that where you had to level up to get to the good uh, multiplayer mode. There are so many slop games I haven't even remember. I, I forgot about so quickly. Holy fuck. With, with Exoprimal, there are so many cool moments in Exoprimal if you stick with it. But the prob problem is, is you should never be able to, you should never have to defend a game by saying you should stick with it to a certain point. No, after, yeah. After point, the game should, the game should allow you to experience itself. IMO, the game Truly should allow you to experience some of the best games. moments from the beginning because <laughs> hey, I don't want to eat yeah. like a dinner, right? I'm going to make a food analogy because gamers fucking love food. I don't want to eat a dinner Ugh. and then have somebody shit on my plate and say, dude, dude. Dude, the crab rangoons are right under the shit. You just have to keep eating feces until you get to the good <laughs> stuff. Oh keep, keep shoveling shit till you taste gold. Exactly. So, like, there are moments in Exoprimal uh, that I love yeah. where you fight the um the Neo the Neo T Rex, and it's a full six man raid where it summons two thousand raptors, two thousand raptors in a waterfall, cascading waterfall of dinosaurs, and it looks so fucking cool. And then Exoprimal. It looks fun. That's the thing. But uh, try to convince anyone. But you have to get through like 20 different missions. And I mean, of course, this was at the launch of the video game. They might have improved it since then, of course. Um, but you have to get through 20 to 30 missions of, okay, fight 50 raptors. Fight 50 raptors. Fight 50 pterodons. Okay, they're flying. They're flying. Cool, cool, cool. Fight one Carnosaurus, which is like a small T-Rex. Cool. Now fight the enemy team. Awesome. You did it. Now do this 19 more times before we get allow, allow you to get to the fun and the different dinosaurs. Because not every dinosaur type is unlocked from the start. You have to unlock enemy types as you oh progress through the video game. Fucking, I... I'm going to rip my skin off. I feel like you're going to classify this as slop, but you're describing sludge to me. Yeah, yeah. this sounds like the, the, it is. It is slop. Sludge, it is sludge that can transition. It is sludge that can transition into slop. Yeah, because I'm uh, like, you know, when I look at gameplay of it, I'm just always like, man, this looks so fun to play. And then I hear about the progression system and I'm like, oh. Is it true that they made it so you don't actually have to engage with the multiplayer part of it? You can just turn that off and do PvE? 
or is that- yes yeah so so there there are the the pve mode the thing is is still pvp oh so you have to kill as many dinosaurs as the other team right like pretty much like, like it's still an objective the the thing is is pvp isn't turned off as pvp is turned off but like competitive pve is still there i.e when you play a match in the pve vp mode uh you kill dinosaurs until you get to the last segment where you either do payload or capture points and then the enemy team can also fight you versus the pve versus the pve where you just kill dinosaurs, but then it's competitive at the end. Um, and I think you can still invade in those modes as a dinosaur against the enemy team. So it's still got PvP elements in it. All right, yeah. This feels like they misunderstood the assignment. I don't give a fuck about killing people. I want to kill dinosaurs. Regardless. Right? Like, I don't know. That is the end of the Slop and Sludge segment. Uh, I had a lot to say about a lot of video fun. games. We had fun. And let's talk about good video games now. Good yes. video games. Can I start with my not game of the year? This I, motherfucker. This I, fuck. Sorry, I did... I, I, I just wanna I just wanna showcase a DLC that I think is really 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 good by a small independent studio. You know what? No. My favorite DLC was a medieval black labyrinth. I just need to talk about it because a medieval is one of my like top three best games ever made. I fucking love a medieval. Uh, black labyrinth is basically like the team coming back a few years after the fact with like all the knowledge on what makes a an a medieval level good. And it is one of the. It's probably like the best level design in any fucking single player FPS ever. It, wow. It's a spectacle. What a, it, no, what like, a actually, strong statement. It's I, I I genuinely believe that that fucking it, the way it guides you naturally, the way encounters are so finely tuned on the higher levels and the way that it, it like it's actually a spectacle. Like, I don't even want to spoil the moments that are crazy, but you see like it, it plays with your expectations in such interesting ways. It's so good. It's fucking ridiculous. And you can like it's it's such a cheap game to get as well. You can get like the a medieval with a medieval black labyrinth for like dirt cheap a lot of time. And it's always worth you it. fuck. You're going to make me buy another video. Game. <laughs> I was thinking about picking it the up. the weapons. Oh, my God. The weapons. Holy fuck. The new weapons, the new like b big fucking gun in this, like the scythe. Oh my god, it feels sex. It's sex. It's sex, dude. It's so good. Yeah, that's it. That's my that's my medieval gush. I, I'm so pissed off you're going to make me buy another video game. I call them boomer shooters because every time I see a new one, I want to boom my shooter brains out. I boom boom. Oh, so. speaking of which, <laughs> I got to talk about Slayer's X a little more, man. I do love Slayer's I X. I just wanted to point out a medieval's made by New Zealand devs. Smile. It's made by New Zealand devs? Uh, yeah. Uh, never mind. I, I'm not going to play with medieval. Sorry, Cameron. You kind of you kind of unsold this me. Guy. On Oh, oh, Brendan, you played Slayer's X? Uh, when I played Slayer's X, I streamed it, and uh, Zane actually was in chat, uh, like, talking about yes! how fucking cool he was. It was such a cool experience. Yeah. Cool. Let's fucking go! Oh, I love Zane. He gave me a free copy. He told me I was awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're like <laughs> we're, we're like best friends actually. Fucking that game is so good. It, it's so I love it. it's I, so I, I, fucking I love the, earnest. Can we, can we just really quick talk? Because I think one of the best parts of that game is the way it, it like how it exists, okay. like how it got created. We should probably. It's I, so I, funny. We need to. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people don't even know what this game is. So the a very context, a very yeah. brief rundown is that there is a different video game called Hypnospace Outlaw, which is basically a, a detective uh, point and click adventure game that it it, it simulates uh, browsing the internet in the '90s, but it's like an alternate reality uh, version of it, uh, and you uh, you serve as to you you serve to moderate it, and it becomes like a conspiracy conspiracy detective uh game it's really fucking good and fun and it it, perf it perfectly encapsulates the feeling of falling down into a weird rabbit hole at 2 a.m and then just letting the darkness embrace you um but one of the characters in hypnospace is a 14 year old called zane rocks 14 he's actually 15 though um but his username says 14 um and he's awesome uh and uh he, he spends most of his time uh bullying other kids and making comics where he meets his favorite band called seepage um 
uh, and like they bully people together and he's like really awesome and uh, he made his own video game recently he's like 38 now but his username on Twitter says he's 36 um, uh, and it's it's called Slayers X Terminal Aftermath Vengeance of the Slayer and, it's th- and this is not this is not in hypnosis this is a real game. yeah no it, well i mean i mean i mean it is made by zane but uh, who's a character in hypnospace but like it, it you can play it it's a standalone experience but it's a boomer shooter yeah well it's, it's be- because shooter. zane is a boomer now so he he started making it when he was 15 and like then he lost the files until he was like 38 and then he finished it yeah. up now so it's just a, it's just a it's a doom mod imagine if a video game was made by a man child but it actually released and, and and plays really good and the art is like amazing yeah i've uh, I, I haven't i'm yet to play it I, I i do need to but like it's just that that aesthetic like the how well it's captured mm-hmm. um and like the, the the references and stuff like that like to anyone who i mean i i didn't grow up in the 90s but you know there's a lot of like secondhand nostalgia that i feel like everyone has um yeah for that that era i mean it's just it's and just it, really charming to see it's i mean yeah. he, and you can feel the passion that zane has for that era through the game it's just it in so many ways it is so earnest you know it's it's a story it, it, it's it's a game about how goofy that shit was as much as it is a character study about people like zane inadvertently because of course zane made the game but it tells you a lot about zane and also as like the oldest person here as as a 30 year old myself who has like who lived through like that era sentiently like I, like wow it, it it captured so much. Yeah, that's right. I'm calling you out. Um, it 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 captures so much of like the uh, watching Goku AMV in the end Lincoln Park <laughs> on YouTube.com for the first time. Yeah, I remember. I mean, that also time. drawing like, the cool S in my notebook. I feel like for you, Brendan, like it's a it must be especially reson it must res- resonate especially well because it's a game made by a guy who lived that life and also lived in fuck ass nowhere Iowa. Ex- for- well, like. It lived in fuck ass nowhere, and also I have the unique perspective of um, since my mom had me when she was fifteen, I was also raised on things that she was raised with. So like I'm a I'm a weird hybrid of eighties, nineties, and two thousands kid. Oh, that rules! Uh, because I, I I like experienced this stuff alongside like my uncles at a younger age, um, and so like living in bum fuck nowhere and and just like listening to. Uh, fucking uh, corn on the radio on the way to school. Yes. Like, yes. The, the the vibe of this game gave me uh, what I call the tinglys, where I genuinely feel nostalgia in such a positive way that it heals my entire mood for the rest of the day. Like, Slayer's X for me was a genuine healing experience in a lot of ways. I love that That's game. That's so nice. One of my favorite things Man. about the aesthetic is that it reminds me of uh, when I was a kid, I used to play a uh, fucking the shareware version of. Um, What's the fucking what? Oh God, Redneck Rampage! God, what a stinky <laughs> fucking game! That game fucking blows, and it's so full of it, it's so full of like doo doo references. Like it constantly references shit. Yeah, and this game does the same mm-hmm. thing where it constantly like you freaking turd, and like, there's just like shit everywhere. Yeah, like rooms just are, have gigantic poop blobs everywhere. Like one of the enemies <laughs> is literally so just made out of shit. Stupid. It's actually wild as like um a little bit of like. Dissonance, I guess, a, a similar video game too. And I, I know we got to move on to talk more about game of the year. I just wanted to mention a similar video game that I played because I played a lot of boomer shooters this year is um 77p Egg Wife, where it, have, yes, it, it I, also I, has yeah. kind of yeah. like a crusty vibe, but it's less earnest than Slayer's X. And it's also based on, I think, a brony musician or somebody who was a brony what? musician. What the fuck? What? Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. boomer shooter. It's called 77p Egg Wife, uh, but it's much more akin to Postal uh, because it has a dedicated pissing button. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Interesting. Uh, so I, ju- I just wanted to mention it because playing Slayer's X and playing 77P Egg Wife, I enjoyed Egg Wife, but I enjoyed Slayer's X more because of how earnest everything felt versus how ironic everything in Egg Wife is. There's sincerity there. Cameron, what did you enjoy more than all those games combined? Speaking of segues. Yeah, because I didn't play any of those. Fuck I you. played Alan Wake 2. Yeah! Which is my game. Whoa! Oh, who would have guessed? I, I, I love that game. Uh, but it does. I have huge complaints about it. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I, I'm gonna save that for a second, just so you can gush, though. I want to gush about 
Yes. Probably the best presentation I've ever seen in a video game. Holy uh, shit. Mixed with um, it's unbelievable. One of it's the, actually unbelievable. One of the, like, most interesting character studies uh, and connections to, like, previous games and, like, reflections on them while, like, not being overly pretentious and in some instances making fun of how fucking pretentious it is. Uh, it's... And it plays incredibly well and somehow that's like a side p- point to the rest of how good this game is really um it's not yeah no it's not my favorite like it, it, it the way it plays is fantastic and that's not even my favorite bit oh yeah that's it's, it's in my top shocking. three of all time like it is bumped what? out control as number three yeah no it's probably in it's probably in my top okay. games of all time i need to well. give my context here for this i'm in the middle of playing the first game every other night um just Ooh, oh boy, boy. Yeah, the birds, Julian. Honestly, hey, talk, speaking of slop, <laughs> yeah, the birds. Alan Wake One, I, actual slop. I deliberately avoided playing that. Let me uh, let me say, I I'm liking it. Oh, I like it, but it's slop. But yeah, no, but that's why I like it is because it's like there's enough interesting going on. Like, okay, the 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 moment to moment writing is kind of dog shit, but like in a really fun, campy way. And there's enough going on with the story uh, that is actually interesting. Uh, to make me want to stick around and gameplay wise, it's the perfect kind of seventh gen schlock garbage that makes me nostalgic for being around when that was the best we had in gaming. So it's it's like it's like it's it's really great comfort food. Motherfucker saying the moment to moment writing is bad. You ain't never even seen Twin Peaks. I, I'm fucking yeah. Hiding. I was I was gonna say you you saying that you made enemies today. I think yeah. By saying that the writing in Alan Wake One is bad, it's like I I don't know. I think I think it's good. I think it emulates it emulates Twin Peaks and uh, Stephen King extremely well. I think it achieves what it's going for, but I don't like what it's going for. Is what I would say about Alan Wake One. Like it's it's definitely intentional in the way that it's written. Alan Wake as a yeah. character uh, to be a shitty writer, and also the <laughs> fact that he's the one narrating the everything, so everything yeah. is shitty. I well, mean, that's the also point. also the perspective that Alan Wake 1 has is when you think about Sam Lake's writing, you also have to think about what kind of media that he is consuming at the time. And if you listen to the Alan Wake Remastered, um, Mm -hmm. there is a commentary track for the entire game for Alan Wake Remastered that is very good. One of the mentions is that there were at the time a lot of DVD box sets released. So the reason the video game is episodic is because uh, of the video, not because of like binging or Netflix culture, but right before it uh, is is the idea of you buy a DVD box set of a television series and then you, you just watch the whole thing in one night. So that's why the game is portrayed in episodes. And it's so good at that. It mm. really does give off the same vibe of binging a box yes. set. Another big thing, like, is the the type of media that was releasing then, like crime procedurals, how they were presented. Um, not only like the Twin Peaks references, but also the way that like CSI or or any like cop procedurals were presented back in like 2010. Um, how much influence that had on the game, uh, similar to Alan Wake Two, where so many of the visuals are are so. Um, um, I talk about inspiration versus imitation a la, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. uh, so deadly premonition versus Alan Wake two, uh, where you can see like deadly premonition is still a very good, bad video game, but it's very much imitation twin peaks. Whereas mm. Alan Wake one and two are very much, um, inspiration. So you can see everything that's built um, in Alan Wake two. No, it's not. Yes, no, uh, it's where not. He, he says he's never he seen didn't it. even know. Yeah. He doesn't Why even know what Swery twin peak lies. is. Which is the funniest thing ever when twin peaks episode one literally has Dale Cooper pulling out a, a, a thing out from under the fingernail. And the same thing happens in twin, uh, in deadly premonition where Francis York Morgan pulls out a, a red, flower petal or red seed from under the um the dead the, the deceased <laughs> there, body literally shot for shot there are like scenes in ellen wake 2 which make me just it's it gives me back that sense of awe and wonder you got f- when you're like a kid playing video games for the first time not holy understanding shit. how yeah, no, shit's that, made holy shit I, I, th- that game has moments of just how the fuck did they even how can you even think of this shit and how can you even manage to pull it off? Yeah. I want to I want to ask specific questions here as someone coming like who's who's only got the first game as reference, right? Like yeah. I am fascinated to see 
because eventually I will play it. Um, but I'm fascinated to hear what you guys think in terms of how the studio has grown and how that growth is reflected in Alan Wake Two as opposed to Alan oh, Wake One. Oh, it's they've built up. They've built up on everything else. Like their their FMV work from Quantum Break to Control to yeah. this. Yeah, you can see the progression and how they are testing it from the projector scenes and Control mm-hmm. to the you know the full on fucking episodes that they had in Quantum Break, and then now in Alan. Wake 2 they combine all of that they use that technology to make some of the best scares i've ever seen in a game what about uh what about the gameplay like how how does it build on alan wake 1 uh the gameplay is actually really really genuinely good it's a la a kind of resident evil silent hill ash it, it just it plays like a one of the newer resident evil yeah games. It plays kind of like re4 so, remake did, did they keep the flashlight mechanic yeah, yes it does it's a little bit different between saga and alan wake but also the same like because they get different kinds of enemies depending there's on what two, campaign there's you're playing. two yeah there's two yeah. uh yeah, two, two campaigns for context for anyone who hasn't played the flashlight mechanic makes it so that at least in the first game you can't harm any enemy until you shine enough light on them so it becomes uh, you yeah. can harm them they just have a shield that basically makes them invulnerable uh, so it's like it's like resource management you have to focus your reticle on individual enemies before you can really harm them properly. One of the one of the only like I feel like downsides, but not really a downside because it's not overt in Alan Wake Two, is the introduction of the, uh, the RPG light mechanics that are effervescent throughout every video game released in the last like three oh, years. Yeah. Uh, but it does I mean, handle them a little whatever. bit better. Um, one of the one of the um one of the cool modifiers I got for Saga because uh so they each have different upgrade systems. Saga finds pieces of the manuscript and then has her charm bracelet, whereas Alan just finds words of power that upgrade him directly. Um. <laughs> Saga, I did find an interesting charm that allowed me to use the hunting rifle to just shoot through the shadows. Yes. Yeah. The upgrades you get are so meaningful that oh, they're yeah. worth. Oh, but some of them have trade offs. Meaningful though. upgrade I, like, tree. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Some of uh, one one thing I want to say real quick though. This might be one of the only video games where I was genuinely so fucking scared, dude. What? There are actual like. No, I'm dead ass. This game is scary as fuck. This game has like actual scary moments you're you're really hyping me up for this um so much of the jump scares and the horror are so based on the stylization of twin peaks the return and it's very obvious that sam lake watched twin peaks the return um before making this game or before like working on the visual direction the of jump it. scares are not what scare me i the jump scares are the problem i have with well it. not just the jump scares but also the visualization of how how so many things are done like the um if if I ever get a chance, I should show y'all the Twin Peaks: The Return episode uh, with the uh, the the glass box and the couch. The guy watching the glass box because mm. it's it's frightening mm. and it comes out of nowhere and it's genuinely stunning. Just before yeah. we uh, move on to who who is next wants Me. to go, um, I, oh, I, I, I'm not done. I still want to talk about Alan. Yeah, Lake. he if Billy needs to complain about it because I, I I think this game comes with the caveat of you should not play it right now. What? It's so broken. when this comes out, I hope because of the patches they've already done, it's fixed a lot of it. Um, I haven't been able to finish the game because I'm at a I'm at a point where I'm just locked from progression until they fix a bug. Sounds like Remedy needs to remedy their game. <laughs> It is actually it is actually really bad. There are, there are some really fucking giant issues yeah. with this game. Can you explicitly say say what they are without spoiling? No. One of the things I had there was an area where I was hard locked out of going into the next area because there was a chair that had there was like a destruction uh, fr- from like the terrain and a yeah. chair got blown into the walkway and I couldn't move past it or move it. Uh, uh, Cameron, do you remember the clip I sent you of um, there's a point near the end of the video game where if you run through a door, you literally fall through the world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, also, like the the amount of times that I got stuck in Saga's mind place or like pause menu, little like save mm-hmm. area. Yeah, no, same. Uh, the amount of times where I had to fully restart the game because I got completely locked in there. Uh, there's one. There's a mm. notorious scene at the beginning of the game when it's like explaining how to use Saga's mind palace. And don't laugh. It's actually called the <laughs> Mind Palace. Uh, it's called place. the Mind Place. Mind Place. Mind place. Mind sorry, place. It's, sorry, it's, it's, it's sorry. using the Mind Palace technique. Either way, there's a very notorious bug at the beginning of the game. I don't know if it's patched out, but it, it's so broken that most people have to, like, this is the morgue. It literally happens 15 minutes in the game. Uh, and a lot of people are locked because of the Mind Palace just not um, fucking working. But hopefully Jesus. by the time you guys are listening to this, uh, it would be resolved. But who knows? Yeah. Also, one thing I, I need to talk about 
the jump scares really quick jump scares are fucking hurt what some of the worst oh, i've ever seen yeah there's, there's there's some jump scares in the game where it's just kind of like dumb. grandma oh. it's worse than cheap because the audio literally clips this game has amazing audio everything sounds beautiful it sounds like it's so like the dynamics everything it's it's so well mixed and then when a jump scare happens it literally it's it, it fucking the waveform becomes a sausage and it clips and it's like ah! I hope you it's, audibly engineer um, it to display what you to, to demonstrate what you mean to people who don't get what it, what you were describing. I don't want to do it because I don't want to break people's ears. It's <laughs> actually horrendous. It's well, so I mean, bad. I, I uh, would you say that it is cynical? No, I, okay. I, I think it, I don't think so. I think it might be genuine. Anyway, my last thing before we move on to the next person, yeah. Brain Brendan. Um, it's probably got the best cold open I've ever played in a game as well. I love it. Oh my so god, much. yes. Oh my I god, yes. So that much. cold open. It, it would be even better if the jump scares weren't fucking awful. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't even think there were, there weren't jump scares in, in the. I mean, don't whatever. Yes, matter. there were. What? All right, oh, 100%, so right. I'm not getting into this. <laughs> All right, that's, that's, yeah, we'll move on. Brendan, um, I so to differ, it probably Alan Wake two. Um, but also I, I wanted to pick a different one because you were already going, we were already going to discuss Alan Wake 2 anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I was ruminating on it for a while because, uh, RE4 remake and Dead Space remake also came out this year and I both enjoyed those heavily. However, um, I've decided to change my, my mind on all of those because I remembered a video game that I did play this year that I really enjoyed, uh, that has been talked about to death, but I still wanted to make mention of it. It's the, uh, my house wad. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Fuck. I, Yes! Yes! yes. Dude. Yeah. What? Absolutely! Oh my God! Yes! I'm I'm, I'm about to read House of Leaves because of that fucking thing. I am reading House I didn't of Leaves even because think of about it. that. Um, how you like wait, it? Wait, so they far? did a House I, of Leaves game and wait, I didn't, I don't know. You did not know about my house, Dalwad. Doom. I thought that I thought you guys were talking about like fucking uh, J was it John? Okay. Uh, okay. Ramir Ramirez, is it Sigil? Uh, Sigil? That's Sigil. The John Romero. Uh, John Romero's uh, house. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, house. DLC. So very, very briefly for people lost, um, because people who don't know what a wad is. Yeah, no. Even beyond oh God, that, though, so um, very briefly on the book. The book is. I, I know next to know nothing about it, but all you need to know is that no, it is. No, like, no, no. Stop, 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 stop. stop. You don't need no, to know stop. anything about. You don't need to know you anything about it. Need, Just go into it. You need That's to know. That's why I brought nothing. it up is because it's not something that you can really talk about unless you played it. But I do genuinely like everything about that game except for some of the extraneous material. Um, it's. Genuinely one of my favorite experiences of the year. I don't think you should talk about... We should not talk about my house. Dot okay. what I, all we should say is what it is, how to play it, because it's free. It doesn't take too long, and your mind will be fucking blown by what some, what just some people it. are capable of. It's so good. No, even more so is you should just sit down and play it and experience it. I don't know if we should even mention House of Leaves, if I'm honest. Honestly, I, I think that any if you if you know about House of Leaves, then it's a great sell. And I, I, I think it's a hardline thought, and I don't think it's a terrible one that you should go into something. Um, certain certain video games or certain experiences should be played without like uh without like learning any extraneous knowledge of it. Um, a la like Undertale back in the day was one those ones where it's like just play it go into it um yeah and, totally and the idea that other people can ruin it for you um my house is the first time i've ever thought go into this video game with go into this 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 wad this doom map without knowing nothing about it just play it experience it don't talk to people about it unless they've already played it just start it go do it like i i don't even want i don't want to spoil or do anything for it just fucking play it so one of one of the things i'm gonna say really quick one of the if you don't know what a wad is a wad is a it's a map pack for the original doom listen all you need is jeezy doom which is a it's a modern repack of doom one and doom two and then all you need to do is download my how my house dot wad my here's the premise real quick my house dot wad is just this dude on a forum put up a map like this is real like this is actually how the game released uh he put up the map on a forum and said hey guys uh i recreated i i what what is it like i found this uh this old i, I, ma I made a house uh, i made my old house. i made my old house from the 90s check it out that's that, it that's yeah, all you need to know that's all yeah yeah moving on yep. fucking play okay. it okay okay right. okay last one i i want to talk about my favorite game of the year uh 
Resident Evil 4 remake. I'm surprised because like you were such a skeptic before it came oh, out. Oh yes, of course I am. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I know. So it's like I I, I didn't hear I, I didn't know that you did a 180. Oh yeah, no, I played it and uh, I was immediately hooked. Wow. Re Resident Evil 4 remake was able to it, it, it it's amazing. It's so good. It, it it modernizes the game in such like it's perfection, dude. It took it took a game that I a lot of people would look at it and say like, hey, this is a masterpiece. And then they, because the thing, the big thing about Resident Evil Four that is important to me is like the tone of it. It has to be camp, yeah. but it has to be sincere. Yeah, and I feel like it's such a lightning in a bottle game. Totally. And the, the crazy part is the remake actually was able to not only make it more serious, it also like because there are bits that are, they made a few bits like a bit scarier. There are a lot of surprises, like a lot of bits from the original game have been like reworked to surprise the returning player, which is fucking awesome because that means you can play the remake and then go back and have a different experience. Exactly. The best kind of remake it, uh, it does uh, it doesn't replace the original, but it serves as like it, it serves as a beautiful new thing to complement it's source material yes mm. it's just so good i i actually play i replayed that game five times wow i need to play yeah, it i loved it so much i speed run i i i speed ran the game i did a i did like challenge runs i i did a revolver no heal run it's amazing that that game is just amazing it plays so well it's so arcadey and fun it's fascinating to me because as opposed to resi 2 um i'm not gonna talk about three because that one's a bit more uh, Stinky. but in terms of resi 2 it's like uh, and not to say that it's easy by any stretch of the imagination but it must have been easier to modernize because resi 2 original was so fucking dated well that original re4 was literally the standards for survival horror for so long yeah, not even survival horror third person shooters Dude, well, I, I played Resi 4 for the first time like a year or two ago on the Switch, and I honestly, like, I'm surprised at how palatable it, it, it still is. Like, I played newer Resident Evil games, bounced off them, went back to 4, played it, and was like, okay, I think I get why Resident Evil games are good, actually. This is this fucks. Yeah. Like, uh, Yeah, I, I felt really cynical about it, because the thing is, the, the game is like, it's one of those games that's so perfect, and it's so, like, lightning in a bottle, and, like, mm -hmm. how I saw it, it, and also, it didn't, it, 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 it isn't that old. I mean, okay, I guess it is old. Yeah, now. It Holy is. shit, how old is is it 20 years? Yeah. No. Is it actually? It's like yeah, 2004. Pretty much. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's almost 20 years old. Okay, maybe maybe it is a bit old, but in my <laughs> mind it just it didn't require a fucking remake like Resident Evil 2 did. It's not that dated. Yeah, it's like Halo, you know, where it's like when it came out, it changed everything so much that like it feels modern by virtue of the fact that it was like, you know, the first one to break ground in so many yeah. new ways simultaneously. It's like, oh fuck. Yeah. This is why we think this stuff is modern. It's shocking that um that they are man they managed to make such a good remake of something that feels so modern compared to what they had done before. It's like if you asked me to like it, like if you modernize a, a really old boomer shooter, then I can see it being easier because those games have aged and gotten crusty. But compare that to Halo One, it's like yeah, it's crusty, but like it's still very playable. Like it set the standard in so many ways that you go back to it and you immediately know like oh. Yeah, this is a first-person shooter. Yeah. Same for, for Resi 4. It's like it's very intuitive as once you get the hang of it because it fucking laid the groundwork for everything that came after. And yet, everyone who's played the remake says that it's like, oh yeah, no, they fucking they freshened that shit up so much. It's just it's really impressive. Mm. It it feels like two different games, and it's it, it does it really well. It, it's it's just I don't know. It's yeah. perfect. Let's move on to... Let's move on. I, What's this? Community post. <laughs> I, we've got a few. We've got a few villains that I just want to cover. We won't go over all of them just because we're we've, we're over oh, time. Sh um, I mean, there's also a shit ton of them. But Thank there's you a shit ton of them. But yeah. I feel like the main ones that we've like not touched on are like Borders Gate yeah, Three. Yeah, uh, what we did was we went and asks we we asked some patrons what their games of the year was and why it was. So let's we're, we'll read a few of those and talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Tyler Murphy says, uh, Borders Gate 3 has been a tough one to beat for me. I love the characters, I love the gameplay, and I love the game as a whole if you think you, you can try it kind of vibe throughout. 
the amount of damage that Baldur's Gate 3 will do to the tabletop gaming community will oh, reverberate throughout it, the it, world for yep. the next few years. <laughs> yeah. I yep. will say Baldur's Gate 3 gets worse with with each act, but even by the end of Act 3, it's still really good. Just, you know, Act 1 is fucking incredible because it was polished for the entirety of the game's runtime and early access was pushing them in different directions the whole time. If you think you can solve a problem a certain way, you probably can. Whereas by the time you hit Act 3, it's like there's a very clear way to do most things but game is fucking great overall great writing good shit game good oh yeah really good uh, game. even if they even if they do reset the stakes at the end of act two and introduce new enemies out of nowhere a really good game my only issue with it is going to be i feel for gms and dms who are going to have to deal with people who played Baldur's gate three oh, shout man. out to cameron in session three of perilous session four <laughs> Vision four. four, sorry. Session four of Perilous. Well, because um, the gamification of tabletop isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I'm a I'm a DM and a GM when it comes to tabletop. I'm very much I think of it as like cooperative storytelling versus like you're a gaming. general motors. I'm a d game master. Oh, oh game dungeon master, master game oh master. God. Game master is for games that aren't Dungeons and Dragons. Julian, have you never played D and D? Mm, once in my life. Oh, okay. I listened to the PST podcast though. Ooh. There you go. The, the, it's not that I have an issue with it. It's more so that as a DM or a GM who is much more about the collaborative storytelling essence, I'm worrying about players being like, hmm, a character. I would like to roll deception on this character a couple of times. Oh, geez. Uh, can I roll passive perception to see if there is something maybe around here that I can find? And I'd be like, <laughs> you are in a grocery store. Your character is trying to buy olives and onions for a character outside. Do you want to leave the grocery store? I don't like I'm like the 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 worry that I have for the game isn't that necessarily it's a bad game or th that it's like really just a bad influence. I just I feel for DMs and GMs who play a very specific way uh, and and Baldur's Gate will introduce players to their table that are like, dude, I played Baldur's Gate and let me tell you something. Yeah. Are there any crates on this map? Oh, awesome. God. Awesome. Awesome. Can I, uh, <laughs> I, I stack the crates? crates. I, stack I stack the, the crates, crates, dude. All right, dude. Hey, bro. Are there any non playable characters I could romance in this campaign? Well, that's been a problem. That's been a problem. I mean, that's, been, that, that's not years. new. This let me, is let me tell you the amount of people that have been like, I would like to lustily romance the barmaid. Can I fucking fuck them? How boobalicious is this bitch? Can I roll? <laughs> I once had a player at a table ask, Can I roll to see what breast size my character is so I can tantalize the pirate captain? And I'd oh be like, What the God. fuck are you talking about. God. Jesus Christ. Anyway, I would tell them to leave. <laughs> there's, there's my caveat with Baldur's Gate 3. Amazing game. Never beat it. Probably never going to beat it until the enhanced edition is out. Still very, very good. Is it confirmed they're working on an enhanced edition? They're going to. It's no, Larian. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bess's favorite game of the year was Hi-Fi Rush. Says it was phenomenal. Loved playing Great it. Great choice. Characters felt uh, really sticked in my head. The controls felt like butter and going uh, good in that game felt fucking awesome. And I agree. Yeah. Hi Fi Rush. Yeah, I feel great. like. Didn't play it. I feel like Hi Fi Rush has. N there's nothing you can. There's nothing to add. I feel like it's so simple, but it. Like it, in concept, it's so simple. Everything about it is like. I don't know. It's just such a simple game. There's not much to say apart from just it's phenomenal. It might have some of the best. Uh, it might have some of the best adaptive music I've ever seen implemented in. Oh the yeah. Game. Oh, for and the soundtrack sure. is bang. yeah. Uh, rare that you get a game with like licensed music that is as consistently good as Hi-Fi Rush's, and also the original stuff matches it most of the time. It's very good. Uh, and then also the animation was an absolute triumph in that game. Oh yeah. Some of the 3D rigs that they designed, the wolf enemy dude, the wolf enemy dude, there's like, mm. the, 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 I can't believe what they pulled off in a fucking real time Unreal I, it game. It just feels like watching it feels like watching a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. It's mm. fucking awesome. Incredible. It's very, very lighthearted. It's so pleasant. It's awesome. Yeah. Just beautiful comfort Speaking food. Of Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, Bropius's favorite game was Armored Core 6. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> big fucking robot. Very good one. Yeah. Yeah. In seriousness, this is great to see FromSoft going back to Armored Core. Um, and like, you know, it's, if is out there with other games that suck them completely into it, like Nier Automata, Outer Wilds, MGS3. I've been playing a little bit. Really good. I've beaten it twice. I've tried to get into Armored Core 6. I have issues with Armored, with getting into big robot games because there's like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very like character. I, 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 I love my characters and that game is all about 
having no characters, <laughs> which is weird. There's still a story, of course. There's a story, like, and there and are I, characters. I, it is the characters are just giant robots and their handlers. I don't know what you're talking about. The, See, the, the, the story the does thing, have though, a narrative, it, and it does I, have characters, and it does have multiple endings. I, that, uh, I mean, you know, come on, you know what I mean. Well, though. yeah, you it's mean like, like it's there's hard to, it's hard to attach yourself to a character that doesn't have a. It's face. hard to attach yourself to a giant robot when they don't have a giant inflatable ass. I know. <laughs> Man, what the hell? Listen, if that butthole don't look like a sock and bopper, then I just can't enjoy this no, piece okay, of media. All right, uh, and with that, I'm, I'm right, gonna close yeah. the episode. Okay. Oh wait, 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 wait for the Nintendo. Wait, we gotta mention real quick for the Nintendo fans. Zelda and Mario came out. Dang, brother, can you believe it? First episode in the bag! This new show is going to be coming out every second Wednesday, so that means an episode comes out, we take a break, and then we come back. So stay tuned for many, many more episodes coming in the future. The game of the week, as well as just the existence of this new show, was all made possible by the help from our patrons. Here are some of the top supporters on our Patreon. Alan Diver, Art of Vagin, Bjur, Bland But Funny, Boo Poo Lou, Caffeine Addicted Chemist, Cheese Dreams, Chris Chapman, Christian Van Engen, Dasul Burt, Delling City, Dreams of Ice, DX Studios, Eric Scott Gillies, Ethereal, Generic Phoenix, Handsome Destiny, Hater 115, John Requires Lasagna, Kawaii Boy Toy, Leo the Geotech, Loudon Woodward, Mr. Shirt, Random Diamonds, Rocco the Raccoon, Smeet Mono, Spherical May, Teague, The Frost Ace, The Snack Salottle, Winnie Rab, and Will 9455. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.